Okay. Welcome, everyone. It is just 9 o'clock now and want to welcome you all to the Bone California Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force webinar. And I believe this is the, the third of the meetings uh, that have taken place and the first one we're doing only by webinar. Um, we're going to uh, go over, so this is Eric Ponsley with Crimson West, and I have two colleagues who are helping to uh, facilitate the webinar today. We have, uh, uh, Samantha Ramsey, who is our webinar facilitator, and Matt Marvin, who's also helping with the webinar and will be taking notes. Uh, I'm going to be covering a few logistical slides before we'll jump in, uh, since this is uh, a webinar-only meeting. So, uh, key, key process guidelines. Uh, just a reminder to everybody that, that the, the task force is not a formal federal advisory committee, and as such, there are only governmental agencies that are, are included this call in the task is being force. Recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please disconnect at this time. That's getting into one of my another another of my announcements. Um, so uh, and so the the meeting has a specific structure uh, in the sense that we will be having the formal task force meeting from nine to eleven. And, and uh, there will be opportunities during the, the formal task force meeting. Uh, there will be presentations and then opportunities for discussion among the task force members themselves. Uh, and then there will also be uh, opportunities for, for clarifying questions along the way. At, uh, at the end of the formal task force meeting, uh, there will be a public opportunity, a public input opportunity, and that's scheduled from 11 to 12. And this is after the, the task force member, the task force meeting formally adjourns. And we will have an opportunity then for members of the public to either ask questions or, or make comments. Um, as we may have just heard, uh, there will be certain things available following this meeting, including the webinar recording for those who miss the meeting. There will also be copies of the PowerPoints that we'll be sharing. And uh, as mentioned, Kearns and West will be putting together a meeting summary. So some other key process guidelines and proposed ground rules for uh, this webinar. Uh, some of these are in general, and some of them are more webinar specific. No, I'm going to shave, but I can do that after a okay. while and listen. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to ask everybody to put yourselves on mute, or we'll also be muting folks at the same time. So recognizing that we have a lot of people on the call right now. So want to go over these uh, some proposed ground rules. We want to ask everybody to help honor the agenda and keep us on track. We want everyone to participate uh, actively and respectfully at the same time, um, and to help us uh, keep things on track by focusing your comments and, and speaking concisely. Uh, we will be minding the queue using the raised hands function in the uh, webinar, and, and so we'll be uh, addressing comments on a first come, first serve basis there. So for to make the webinar as successful as possible, we ask that each of you speak clearly into the phone uh, when, when it is your turn to speak. And because others can't necessarily know who's speaking, please start each comment with your name and affiliation. Um, uh, just for the purposes of trying to keep the background noise down, we will be uh, muting the phone lines unless a participating task force member is going to be speaking during one of the um, discussion periods or during a clarifying question opportunity. Um, when the phone lines are, lines are unmuted, we do ask everyone to please keep your phone muted individually, again, just to keep the, the background noise down. Um, a couple other things about the webinar. Um, Uh, we want you to use the raise hand icon. And so that is uh, up, up at the top where you, you see the little icon of a person raising their hand. You can raise your hand or lower your hand using that. And there's also an opportunity uh, if you just want to uh, share a question or you have background noise and you want to share a comment in writing, you can use the Q&A pod in the lower right there. Um, 
And then finally, for those of you who want to make or having a hard time seeing the slides, you can use the uh, next to the uh, stop sharing button at the top there, you can hit that other icon uh, that, that shows expand screen and that, uh, and, and that should help make things bigger. And then finally, uh, we are, we are going to be using a poll at the beginning for members of the, the public, so non-task force members. If you'd like to share your affiliation, this will help us understand who's on the line uh, when we get to the public comment period. And at the very end of the webinar, we'll also be uh, sharing a, uh, a brief electronic survey to, uh, to let us know how we can continue to improve these webinars in the future. Okay, so th th that's the, the essentially the process guidelines for this meeting. I'm going to pause for a second and ask if there are any questions uh, before we move into introductions. So Sam, if you could unmute folks briefly. Just want to confirm that the, our guidelines are clear for everyone. Okie doke. All right, so let's move into introductions. And, and um, uh, we're going to be using a roll call approach because this is a large task force and we have a, a number of people participating today. Uh, what I'm going to propose that we're going to do is that uh, we've listed in this slide uh, the, the different uh, uh, affiliations that, that uh, task force members have and we're going to walk through them one at a time. And as I go through them, I would like to ask people to, uh, we're unmuting everybody at this point, would like everyone who is a task force member who fits into a particular category to please say your name. And if you're a member of a tribe, please uh, indicate which tribe that you are representing. And we'll try to get through these as quickly as possible. So uh, I'm going to, I'm looking at, uh, to start with the tribes here. Um, Sam, please confirm that everybody's unmuted. Are we good? Yes, we're good, Eric. Okay, great. So I want to invite task force members who are uh, members of tribes uh, located north of San Francisco to please just jump in and, and list your name and tribal affiliation. Please do so now. This is Rosie Claiborne with the Yurok tribe. This is Geneva E.B. Thompson with the Yurok Tribe. Thank you. Other tribes north of San Francisco? This is Jana okay. Ganyan from the Blue Lake Rancheria Tribe. Thank you. Okay, hearing no other uh, tribes north of San Francisco, I uh, want to invite uh, task force members uh, from tribes between San Francisco and Point Conception. Again, any tribal members from tribes between San Francisco and Point Conception? Okay, hearing none, how about uh, tribal representatives from tribes south of Point Conception? Hearing none as well, let's, let's move on to the, top, uh, the category of elected officials. Are there any elected officials participating um, in the task force north of San Francisco? Michael Winkler, Mayor of Arcata. Thanks, Michael. Others? Okay, hearing none, uh, how about uh, elected officials located south of San Francisco? Please introduce John yourself. Heading, John Heading, City of Morro Bay, Mayor. Thanks, John. And, and by the way, we do have someone typing, if you could please go on mute. Okay, any other elected officials south of San Francisco? Okay, good. So we're going to move on to the uh, state agencies now, and, and this should hopefully go a little quicker. I um, want to invite uh, task force members from the California Energy Commission. Please introduce yourselves. 
This is Kara Weeks in Chair Hopeshield's office. Hi, Karen Douglas, Commissioner at the California Energy Commission. Uh, Eli Harlan, California Energy Commission. LaQuinn Wynn, Energy Commission. Okay, great. How about the California Department of Fish and Wildlife? Hi, good morning, Brian Owens, uh, Marine Region. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Brian. How about the California Department of Conservation? Hearing on California State Parks. Go ahead. Is there someone from State Parks? Okay. How about the California Department of Water Resources? Okay. Moving on. California Public Utilities Commission. Daryl Cox. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about the California Coastal Commission? This is Kate Hucklebridge. And this is uh, Doug George from uh, Coastal, Coastal Commission. Commission. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about the California Ocean Protection Council? Good morning, uh, this is Chris Potter. Hey, Chris, how about the California Natural Resources Agency? Okay, Cal EPA. How about the California State Lands Commission? Good morning, this is Christina Kunkel. Good morning, Christina. How about the California State Water Resources Control Board? Um, California Fish and Game Commission. Okay, how about the California State Historic Preservation Office? Okay, next moving on to the Office of Governor Gavin Newsom. Hi, this is Christina Schneider. Welcome. Estelle Fennel. Oh, can you repeat again? Estelle Fennel, Humboldt County. Okay, welcome, Estelle. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone else from the state that I missed? Okay. Scott Morgan, I'm planning research. Oh. Okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, finally, uh, let's move on to the fi final category of task force members from federal agencies, and thanks for your, your patience here, everybody. It, it's hard to find out who's on in, in large webinars like this, starting with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Keen Thurston, the Home California Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force Coordinator. Nancy Samai. John Romero, the Office of Public Affairs. And Doug Boren. Right, anyone else? Oh, say it again, Doug. That's Doug from Boom on. Okay, Doug Boren, thank you. Okay, moving on, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Stacey Borneman with the Migratory Birds Program. Can you repeat, please? Tracy Borneman with the Migratory Birds Program. Thanks, Tracy. Anyone else from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife? How about the U.S. Coast Guard? Good morning. Connor, I'm just group Catalyst. No, go ahead. Good morning. This is Mike Sullivan. Peyton. Okay. 
Okay, we had Mike Sullivan and who else? Carol Connor and Ruth Sadowitz. Thanks, Carol. Um, how about NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration? This is Good Bill morning. Duros with the NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And good morning. This is Sarah Vandershalley with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. This is Russ Redder from Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Candace Mackman with NOAA Fisheries Office of Policy. Okay, great. How about the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission? Hearing none, the Federal Communications Commission? How about the Bureau of Land Management? Hey, good morning. This is Bill Stanley with the California Coastal National Monument. Okay, others from BLM? Um, how about the U.S. Geological Survey? Hearing none, how about Bessie, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement? Hearing none, U.S. EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency? Yes, this is Jason Gardis with EPA Region 9 in San Francisco. Great. How about the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers? Tom Cavanaugh with South Pacific Division. Okay, thanks. How about the National Park Service? Good morning. This is Laura Roselle from the Pacific West Region. Good morning. This is Irina Irvin with the Pacific West Region. Great. Welcome. How about the Department of Energy? Good morning, this is Patrick Gilman with U.S. Department of Energy's Wind Energy Technologies Office. You're welcome. Uh, next, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA. Good morning, this is Cindy Witten, the Obstruction Evaluation Group Wind Turbine Team Manager. <clears throat> You're welcome, Cindy. Um, how about the Department of Defense? Good morning. Steve Chung here representing DOD. You've also got Mr. Ron Tickle and Steve Sample from the Clearinghouse. It's and uh, Bob there. Arnold from Operational Test and Evaluation. Anyone else in the Department of Defense? Okay, great. How about the uh, U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs? Okay, and 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 uh, finally, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Okay, great. Well, thank you, task force members. If if we missed you uh, along the way and you didn't get to introduce yourself, why don't you just put your use the the Q and A text box in the webinar and please give your name and affiliation, and we'll add you to the list. Let's not forget about the fishermen. Yeah, so, so this part of the meeting is just focused on the task force right now. And so we've gone over the agencies uh, that are represented on the task force. And we'll be doing public, uh, in, public input opportunities starting at 11 o'clock. OK, um, so let's um, move on to the, the, the bulk of the meeting here. Thank you for your patience getting that done. I would like to uh, now uh, introduce Jean Thurston Keller, who's the task force coordinator for BOEM to go over the agenda and, and uh, purpose of the meeting today. And we're going to be putting everybody else on mute in the meantime and, and uh, invite Jean to pick it up here. Campo Kumeyaay Nation Tribe, 
Uh, she called in a little bit late. Oh. So just so we can we can add her to our our task force list. Um, okay, so let's begin this morning's webinar with a quick overview of today's agenda items. And if you could pull up the agenda, Eric, that'd be great. Yep, it, it should be up there for everybody. I don't see it. Not there. Nope. Well, we'll talk about the agenda and as we're working on this technical difficulty. Um, so uh, today we're going to cover the purpose of today's meeting and the goals for our meeting today. Uh, we'll include a status update on BOEM's renewable energy leasing process and where we are at and where we're going with our next steps. We will also have a research and studies update from BOEM as well as the Ocean Protection Council and the California Energy Commission. Next, we'll have a summary by an agency working group who has been engaged in focused discussions related to offshore wind in and around the existing Morro Bay call area. Uh, this summary will include a recent map the group has developed and will be a focal point for our task force discussion later on this morning. And we will also hear about the California Energy Commission's notice of availability on outreach for additional considerations for offshore wind off the central coast of California. Then finally, we're going to move into a task force discussion where we look forward to hearing from task force members on their thoughts and inputs regarding the areas on the working group's map that you will see in uh, later on this morning and a potential outreach approach to communicate the map and its contents to the public. And then we'll close the meeting by identifying our next steps. And after the meeting is concluded, we'll have a public uh, input opportunity for folks that are on the line to um, provide input to, uh, to BOEM and to the task force. And so with that, um, I think we're still trying to figure out the slide situation. So I'm going to pause here, Eric, if you want to um, take us to the purpose of our meeting here today slide. So I'm handing it back can over you, to you, Eric. Can you see that now? No. no okay, Tim, I'm, I'm sorry. My I'm advancing and I can see it, but um, if I might, if I might, this is a cell panel. Um, if you put it to slide one, Gene, I think that might be the answer. It came up as slide five on mine. Okay, yeah, I've I've found it. I think I have to click on the side button to move it forward. Yeah. So I have the the purpose of the meeting slide here now. I hope everyone else can see it as well. So today we're going to be updating task force members on progress since our September 2018 meeting. And then we'll discuss additional considerations for wind energy offshore the Central Coast. So again, the focus for our meeting will really be on the Central Coast today. We will talk about the, the North Coast as well. And then outlining proposed future public outreach and uh, an approach. And then finally discuss next steps for the task force. Thank you very much, Jean. So let's move to the opening remarks at this point. And I'm going to be inviting uh, uh, opening remarks from Karen Douglas, commissioner from the CEC, and Doug Boren, who's the regional supervisor from BOEM. I, I did want to just pause here for a second and note that, that uh, when we typically have these BOEM California Task Force meetings, we, we like to open with a, a tribal blessing and acknowledgement of ancestral lands. And obviously, in the webinar format, we're not able to do so. But I just wanted to note that that, uh, that, that remains our intent for future meetings. So at this point, I'd like to invite opening remarks and, and uh, ask, uh, I think, Karen or Doug? Uh, Karen, would you like to go first? Yes, thank, thank you, Eric. So again, this is Karen Douglas. I'm a commissioner at the California Energy Commission. And I'd like to start by welcoming the task force members and the members of the public um, to this webinar. This is the third task force meeting that has been convened by BOEM in partnership with the state of California. The last task force was in September 2018. 
And at that time, the task force heard about and provided input on potential BOEM call areas. Today, the task force will hear a status update following the BOEM call for information and nomination, including new information on recent federal and state investments in research on offshore wind, and new information on an outreach process and next steps that are being taken to work with the public and stakeholders to vet additional possible areas off of the Central Coast. We decided to go with a webinar format because of the challenge with pulling together an in-person meeting in a timely fashion um, in order to be able to bring updates on this issue um, to task force members and the public, and um, particularly on um, upcoming Central Coast outreach activities. We do anticipate that as the work on the North Coast progresses, there will be a need for another task force meeting. Also, as described, there is an opportunity, as has been described, there's an opportunity at the close of the task force meetings for us to hear from the public. So those of you who are on the phone from the public, um, please hang in there. And, and um, I hope you benefit from the discussion. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. Um, so at this point, I will pass the opening comments to Doug Boren. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Douglas. This is Doug Boren. I'm a regional supervisor for the Office of Strategic Resources in the Bowen Pacific Office, located in Camarillo, California. <clears throat> I really don't have too much to add to uh, the great job from Karen. I just wanted to say thank you also to everyone who is participating. Uh, in this webinar, you know, I think it's great for us to be able to do this. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't pay, give a special thanks to Ms. Jean Thurston Keller because she was sending emails late last night trying to make this go forward, and also to Eric and the Kearns and West team for helping us uh, put this webinar on. Uh, as Commissioner Douglas stated, you know, it's been a year and a half since our last task force meeting, so I think this is, you know, timely. We'll be able to have some. Uh, provide an update on what the working group has been doing, you know, the map that's out there, you know, people have been able to see that. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll have some good conversation. I'm looking forward to the dialogue and also the, at the close of the official task force meeting, you know, the BOEM team and the, or the task force team will make sure that we stay on the line so that we can have a comment period and a question answer period with the public who have participated in the meeting also. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jean and Eric. All right. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we're going to move now to our into the, the heart of the agenda with the, our presentations. And the, the next topic is going to be uh, the bone leasing process and an update on research and studies. And can folks see that slide? Yes. OK, great. Okay, so uh, just a, a quick uh, introduction here. We're going to see here three presentations from Jean Thurston Keller, who's the task force coordinator for BOEM, on the status of the BOEM leasing process. Uh, Jean will also present on BOEM research and studies, and then we'll hear additional presentations on research and studies from the state. Chris Potter, who's the Marine Renewable Energy Program Manager for the Ocean Protection Council, and then Sylvia Palmer Rojas, who's the Electric Generation System Specialist for CEC. So we'll hear these three uh, update presentations in a row, and then, time permitting, we'll pause for uh, clarifying questions that any task force members have at that point. So at, this, at that point, let me pass it on to Jean to talk about the status of BOEM's leasing process. Great. Thank you, Eric. Hi, this is Jean Thurston Keller. As Karen stated just a few minutes before, in October 2018, BUM published a call for information nominations, or call, uh, for three areas off the California coast that is located on the screen on your right, one area off the north coast near Eureka, known as the Humboldt Bay Call Area, and two off the central coast, the Morro Bay Call Area near the city of Morro Bay, and the Diablo Canyon Call Area just to the south of the Morro Bay Call Area. The comment period was open for 100 days, and BOEM received 118 public comments. And on the next slide, we'll have a breakdown of the different categories of these comments. We also received 14 nominations of interest from developers in response to the call. All of the public comments 
a list of all the developers and their submitted nominations are available online at BOEM's website at www.boem.gov slash California. Currently, BOEM is in the area identification stage of our planning process, and we're working towards identifying wind energy areas within the three call areas we identified. Any wind energy areas that BOEM has identified will undergo an environmental review under the National Environmental Policy Act. Based on the results of this review, BOEM would issue a proposed sale notice for leasing and terms for potential auction. BOEM plans to move forward with a lease sale offshore California, and we'll be working to complete those steps um, in, the, in the coming months. So the Morro Bay and Diablo Canyon call areas for wind energy development were assessed by the Department of Defense as incompatible with their operations. So BOEM and the state have began discussions with the DOD to examine compatibility issues. And a working group was formed by Congressman Carbajal and Panetta to focus and discuss uh, some additional considerations for offshore wind on the Central Coast. You'll hear more about the working group later on during this webinar. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So here is a breakdown of the comments that we received. Maybe going back one more. So the breakdown on this pie chart uh, is all the comments that we have received um, focused down by major categories. And this is not an all-inclusive list. It covers the major categories, and many of the comments address more than one of these concerns. So the largest categories of the comments, as you can see in the chart, include um, birds, fishing, vessel navigation, and uh, marine mammals. But also uh, in the gray area there, that is, um, I believe, commercial and recreational fishing. No, that's in the yellow. So that is the regulatory process, so BOEM's auction process. If you can go to the next slide, I'll give you an update on all of our research activities. So BOEM has two research studies focused right now on the existing call areas. The first study BOEM is conducting is called the Collection of Meteorological and Oceanographic, or MetOcean, Resource Characterization Data Off the California Coast. This study is a partnership between BOEM and the U.S. Department of Energy with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and we'll be collecting information about the meteorological and oceanographic conditions offshore California using two buoys that's going to be deployed for 12 months within the existing boundaries of the Morro Bay and Humboldt call areas. The two buoys will be deployed this year in either April or May at a location to be determined within the call areas, but within the boundaries of the call areas. So buoy instrumentation is going to measure wind profiles up to 200 meters above the ocean surface using LIDAR technology or light detection and range. And the buoys are going to measure wind speed and direction, barometric pressure, waves, current, salinity, and a lot of other uh, data and information. The collected data is going to help us increase our understanding of wind and wave energy resources. And all of the data collected from the study will be available to the public and shared with our st state and federal agency partners. For our second study, and in response to stakeholder interest regarding visual impact, BOEM had simulations for the three call areas of Humboldt, Morro Bay, and Diablo Canyon. And the, we identified three key observation points, which were chosen with input from state agencies, including California State Parks, to provide representative viewpoints for each of the call areas. Panorama simulations were prepared for morning, midday, afternoon, and night lighting conditions. A meteorological report detailing the weather conditions over a 10-year period was also prepared to inform the effort. And we also worked with the National Renewable Energy Lab to create a hypothetical wind farm model that was used as the um, hypothetical project uh, as a visual simulation. It's not uh, an actual offshore wind farm, I'd like to uh, reiterate, and it is representative of how a project might appear for each of the call areas. So we completed our first set of simulations last summer, uh, which included one key observation point per call area. And it modeled a 1,000 megawatt project using a hypothetical 15 megawatt turbine. And for the Morro Bay call area, BOEM has, for our second study, uh, BOEM is having an additional set of three simulations from three more locations based on agency working group discussions 
and input from state agencies. So these new locations that BOEM is uh, providing simulations for include Julia Pfeiffer State Park, Lime Kiln State Park, and Valencia Peak in Montana de Oro State Park. The second visualization study is actually currently in progress. Final sims are expected to be available by the end of this month and would be an important part of any public outreach efforts that we do on the Central Coast. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Chris Potter with the Ocean Protection Council, who will give you an update on the research activities that OPC is doing. Thank you. Great. Can, can folks hear me? This yep, we hear you, Chris. Great, thank you. Um, so on February 26th, the Ocean Protection Council approved its strategic plan to protect California's coast and ocean for 20 2020-2025. Uh, the plan identifies objectives, targets, and actions in four key areas, climate, equity, biodiversity, and the blue ocean economy. Objectives will be achieved through actions that address a wide range of issues and topics, including, but not limited to, sea level rise, ocean acidification, coastal access, aquaculture, whale entanglement, plastic pollution, wetlands, beaches and fisheries, the plan can be found at uh, opc.ca.gov. Objective 4.4.1 commits the OPC to working with other state agencies towards the development of a commercial scale offshore wind project that minimizes impacts on marine biodiversity or habitat, currents and upwelling, fishing, cultural resources, navigation, aesthetic and visual impacts, and military operations by 2026. This goal will be achieved through two primary actions. Uh, one, work with partners to develop a statewide policy that will establish criteria by 2024 to ensure responsible evaluation and potential implementation of offshore wind projects consistent with state law. And two, continue to fund research and baseline data collection to assess the environmental and socioeconomic impacts of potential offshore wind projects. OPC's offshore wind objective and actions reflect input that we've received from stakeholders during two public comment periods held in 2019. The OPC is already funding research that will provide useful and important information during the environmental analysis of offshore wind energy projects in California. Specifically, we're funding in conjunction with BOEM and the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, a North Coast Offshore Wind Feasibility Study. The study is being conducted by the SHATS Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University. SHATS and the OPC will be hosting a public workshop on April 28th in Eureka to present initial findings about the opportunities and challenges associated with offshore wind energy in the Humboldt Bay region. This workshop is free and open to the public. Additional information on the workshop will be distributed within a couple weeks. Uh, earlier this year, the OPC launched a study with uh, the Conservation Biology Institute and Point Blue Conservation Science that addresses action two by assessing and analyzing the existing body of information on the marine environment contained, when the Cal contained within the California Offshore Wind Energy Gateway. Uh, this study is slated to be completed by the middle of 2021. Uh, we'll be presenting interim work products from the study at future public meetings and workshops. Um, and last, uh, on the heels of the approval of our, of our strategic plan, um, the OPC is considering our options for funding additional research uh, this year and, and over the next several years. So that's the, the extent of my presentation, Eric. Thank you. OK, we'll move to the final presenter. I would like to invite uh, Sylvia Palmarojas from the CEC to present on CEC research activities. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. A CEC research div division has three new efforts related to offshore. In September last year, we released a solicitation in which two out of three objectives were focused on offshore wind energy. We called that initiative Next Wind Sol Solicitation. The results or recommendations from Next Wind Sol Solicitation were released in February this year, 
and the staff is targeting is targeting to present the request and request the approval of the recommended projects in April business meeting. Um, as I mentioned before, next win solicitation has three objectives. Uh, group one was focused on land-based wind energy. However, we as applicants to demonstrate how the proposed on-site manufacturing approach could contribute also to offshore wind projects. Group two was calling for projects that develop operational and environmental real-time monitoring so solutions for offshore wind projects. And staff is recommending two proposals for this group. One proposal is from Acre so Solutions and Subcontractor Cognit. And the second one is from Berkeley Lab, a National Lab and Subcontractor UC Berkeley. The third group was seeking projects that conduct environmental risk assessment for offshore wind energy systems. And a staff is also recommended to uh, proposals, one from Humboldt State University and subcontractor HT Harvey and Associates, and the other one is from Integral Consultants. We are recommending to, to fund in total eight million for next wind proposals, where five million are allocated directly to offshore wind projects. As I mentioned be, uh, previously, these recommended projects need uh, the CEC approvals and business meetings. Also, staff is conducting the study, research, and development opportunities for offshore wind energy in California with Navigant a consulting team. And the objective of this study was to support the process of identifying R&D opportunities to remove or reduce technological, manufacturing, logistic, and supply chain barriers uh, to, to deploy a lower deployment risk of offshore wind energy projects in California. Actually, last week we had a workshop to present the preliminary re re results and solicit public comments that they are open through March 20. Um, also, staff also conducted a research roadmap for utility scale renewable energy technologies with energetic incorporated team. And the team also made three recommendations for offshore wind, um, and offshore wind was part of eight technologies included in the roadmap. And the team uh, based the recommendation on literature review, public webinars, and interviews to experts. Results from Navigant study in the research roadmap will serve as a basis to help our research program prioritize R&D investment opportunities for offshore wind energy. With this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. This is Eric again. Thank you, Sylvia, Chris, and Jean. Uh, we have just a, a couple of minutes to take any quick uh, clarifying questions that uh, task force members might have. And so, uh, Sam, if you could unmute everybody. Is there any quick clarifying question that folks have? Okay. Yep. So, did he? Is that a question coming in? I think someone's just not on mute. Okay, so hearing no clarifying questions on the research activities, thank you very much for, for those updates. We're gonna to move to the, the next uh, agenda item, and Sam, if you could please uh, re-mute everybody again. So, so this, this item has to do with the, uh, the agency working group that Jean mentioned in her report, and, and uh, this is going to be a group presentation. Uh, the, the participants uh, who will be speaking to this topic uh, include Greg Haas, who's the working group facilitator from the Office of the U.S. Representative, uh, Salud Carbajal. Uh, we have Eli Harland, who's an advisor for CEC. Steve Chung, who's the encroachment for program director for the Department of Defense. Bill Duros, who's the West Coast Regional Director for the National Marine Sanctuaries, and finally Doug Boren, the Regional Supervisor from BOEM. And, and here I would like to, I guess, open it up and maybe, um, I don't know whether it's going to be Greg who will take the lead. Uh, we have 25 minutes for this item. Where we're anticipating a, a couple of slides here. Um, and and uh, I'm going to move us up to this item. And then, uh, uh, I believe that uh, you, Greg, will be uh, sharing who will be or who will be speaking at what point. 
So with that, uh, Greg, I'll turn it over to you and, and, and uh, let me know when you want me to advance the slides. All right. Thank you, Eric. Um, this is Greg Haas with Congressman Salute Carbajal's office. I'm in San Luis Obispo as senior district representative. And um, I'll just start off, uh, you have the setting of the stage with the creation of these, the identification of these call areas in Morro Bay and Diablo Canyon call areas. Uh, we'll just be focusing on that. that that's essentially where uh, the issue that I'll be describing came to be. Uh, so as, as was said, um, both the Morro Bay call area and the Diablo Canyon call areas were uh, identified. And um, as input was coming in, DOD, um, and I say that because it covers Navy, Air Force, and others, um, uh, found that the, the two call areas were incompatible with uh, national security missions. That would be testing, training, and operations and uh, off, the, off the coast of the Central Coast. Uh, upon hearing that, uh, the congressman, uh, after several briefings and meetings with stakeholders, uh, contacted the Assistant Secretary of Defense, um, Robert McMahon, and asked him if there was an ability to discuss how we can find a possible solution uh, to accommodate both viable offshore wind in industry uh, off the Central Coast and also meet the mission of DOD. So on August 21st, uh, Congressman Carbajal hosted a meeting in San Luis Obispo with senior officials from DOD, uh, Secretary McMahon, uh, BOEM, Na uh, NOAA, and uh, CEC, as well as Congressman Panetta and some other, a uh, couple other local elected uh, assemblymen and county supervisors. Um, and discuss the, uh, is there a possible solution to creating uh, offshore wind on the Central Coast, uh, with the, in, in, keeping in mind the conflicts with uh, DOD's operations. After, at that meeting, the leadership, um, being Congressman Carbajal and Panetta and uh, Secretary McMahon, decided that it would be best to form a working group to uh, participate in a, a series of meetings to identify some possible solutions off the Central Coast, uh, ones that allowed for, again, a viable industry uh, project, uh, meet the needs of the state, and also the needs of Department of Defense. After uh, that meeting, uh, a working group was formed. Uh, members of that working group are, will be uh, talking about their particular areas uh, after I'm done. But uh, with that forming of the working group, we met uh, a few times, um, devised a possible map uh, for solutions, which uh, will be next slide. Uh, you can see here, uh, identifies these two areas, uh, uh, north and a south region. And after, after discussions with that, we met with uh, leadership again, who said, let's, you know, let's move forward and find out what the public thinks about this. And, and the working group is in the same place. They, right now, we, we, want to, um, we want to hear from the public on these possible areas for offshore wind and whether they can work. The, if you note um, on there, there's uh, the Diablo section, Diablo Canyon. We didn't uh, consider that um, at this time due to you know significant DOD uh, activities in that area, as well as other oppositions that have been uh, voiced to the Diablo Canyon. So mainly the working group focused on the Moore Bay call area as, as um, a possible solution here, and um, looking for compatible locations with current DOD operations, which DOD can elaborate on, Steve Chung, on what that is. You'll notice also that there's a discussion area. Uh, that is a 90 mile, 90 square mile swath uh, in the Nash Marine, Monterey Bay Nash Marine Sanctuary. That was just identified as a discussion um, there's, uh, the, the working group just looked at that. It may be compatible with DOD, but however, BOEM does not have authority to lease or develop a, a call area within any national sanctuary. And NOAA Sanctuaries has no, um, policy or provisions for leasing wind development, um, 
at, at this at this time. So we just labeled the area uh, a discussion area for future, you know, current and future uh, stakeholder and public input. Now, also, uh, I want to bring out that one of the things we identified after we reached this point of the there we go. Um, yeah, after we reached it, yes. Yeah, we lost you for there for a second there, Greg. Yeah, I heard the steps, so I'm not sure where you lost me. I was discussing the discussion area. Um, did you get that? Yeah, we did. Okay, so moving on. Uh, basically, after identifying these two sections of the north and south. Uh, we originally looked at, if you see on the map, a north and south. You also see a section A, and uh, that's a north A and south A. Those are sections that are 15 miles from the shoreline starting, and then the other main areas are 17 miles. Uh, these were locations that we thought might work. They're not necessarily um, a consensus from the entire uh, participants of the working group. It's areas that were identified as possible and uh, was reached that we need to hear from the public on what their thoughts are, uh, as well as other agencies on these, these identified locations. So right now, uh, that's what we're doing, is wanting to hear back from the public and uh, other agencies on these possible locations. Um, well, right, we want to evaluate the potential, and if there is something there, that will be a matter for BOEM to consider, and the state uh, with future, um, after they take future input. So the bottom line here is these are possible areas where offshore wind could work, but we need to hear from the people before moving forward. So that's essentially the uh, my summary of the working group, and I want to uh, hand it over to uh, the others. Why don't we start, uh, Eli? Why don't you start with what the CEC's role was? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Greg, and that was a, a good overview. Um, also, I'll note that uh, following the conversation about the areas, um, we'll also hear a presentation from CEC staff on. Uh, upcoming opportunities uh, for the public to engage on these, um, as well as the process for uh, submitting um, written comment and for accessing um, the information that Greg just went over. Um, so not uh, a whole lot to add other than, um, you know, we do, uh, we do have a public process that is underway on these. Um, we will be having um, upcoming um, uh, public meetings and public dialogue um, about these areas and just wanted to touch on uh, one one piece um, that that Greg spoke to regarding viability um, one of the uh, you know key considerations that um, that we make when we're looking on the central coast is that there is existing um, existing infrastructure um, that could be leveraged um, and utilized so uh, we're um, always looking for ways to um, find areas that could potentially work to be able to take advantage um, of that existing infrastructure. So uh, other than that, um, not a whole m lot more to add, and uh, I could pass it over to, um, I believe Steve is on the line from DOD. Great, thank you, Eli. Greg, thank you so much for that background. Uh, just a quick uh, item to add on here uh, for DOD. So, uh, you know, DOD would like to thank, uh, I think collectively, uh, both Boehm and California for hosting this uh, offshore webinar. And we appreciate the uh, dialogue complete to date with the agency offshore working group. Uh, as shared with the agency members of the offshore working group, uh, the Department of Defense is committed to have additional exploratory discussions and fully support BOEMS and California's upcoming outreach sessions, which uh, I believe Eli, uh, uh, you, or Doug will be going into greater detail, uh, to work towards a collaborative solution for offshore wind in California. 
So thank you for uh, inviting us, and uh, we're happy to engage and continue to support. Thanks, Steve. This is, this is Eric Ponsley. Are there others from the working group who, who want to speak to this as well? Yeah, this is Bill Duros from NOAA Sanctuaries. Maybe just give a little more context um, regarding the aspect that affects the National Marine Sanctuary there. Uh, as you can see from the map, the blue area is all of Monterey, part, parts of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, there's also an area not shown on here, but basically the area south of that has been proposed by the community in San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara County as a new sanctuary, Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. And so for these, the, the reasons that these areas are immediately adjacent to abutting or possibly within a new sanctuary, we've been involved with this working group. And uh, we've, we've also had a lot of meetings with industry, and there's definitely been interest in the possibility of developing that. the lease development within a marine sanctuary, but the marine sanctuary possibly could. It's, our regulations don't necessarily identify wind as inherently incompatible, but uh, industry is familiar with the process where they lease, have sole access, develop an area ultimately, and the National Marine Sanctuary regulations don't have that same sort of mechanism. So while permitting could be possible, it's unclear. Uh, nonetheless, we've participated because we did not want to end up in a scenario where um, potential planning excluded evaluating or discussing, as the map says, a portion of a marine sanctuary, in this case Monterey Bay, and we, we the collective agencies and stakeholders and users, would end up with a poor project design that could be significantly improved if part of the project perhaps was within the marine sanctuary. In that context, we would have um, and would be willing to at least begin an evaluation of what that sort of process could look like in a marine sanctuary. At present, the working group did not feel like that was needed, that there was enough opportunity in these other areas. And so we've, as I said, we are not looking to develop inside a marine sanctuary, so we've been uh, considering that to be satisfactory and will continue to participate in this process. So I wanted to provide that additional context so folks could understand how the sanctuary relates, what the discussion area might mean today, and what it might mean in the future. Thank you very much, Thanks. Bill. And Doug Boren, would you like to, to join and speak from BOEM's perspective? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Just in a, I really can't add too much because it's been so well covered thus far, and I'm really excited to get to the discussion about the areas. I just wanted to throw on, you know, Boehm's role in this is we make areas on the OCS available for offshore wind leasing. Uh, so, you know, that's how we've been coming at it. I did want to point out that, you know, currently these areas, the north area is approximately 149 square miles, and that's starting at 15 miles from shore. And while the south area is approximately 90 square miles, starting 15 miles from shore, uh, you know, this is really the beginning of the dialogue process. Um, you know, when we developed the call areas, uh, you know, and we went out with that very public Federal Register notice for comments on that, and, you know, the, the call area started 20 miles from shore. So this is, you know, what's it like now, uh, you know, now that things are moving potentially in closer, you know, 15 to 17 miles from shore. Um, so that's really the dialogue that's starting. <clears throat> I did want to just say that, you know, Gene talked about earlier where we're going to have the additional visual simulations of these areas. You know, we plan on having visuals of what it's going to look like from the four KOPs at 15 miles, at 17 miles, and at 20 miles so that we can, you know, see, you know, what's going to, what could potentially be out there and see what the difference is between, you know, the 15 and 20. And with that, uh, I'm, I think that we can have the CEC on the notice of availability. And I'll just throw in that, you know, Boehm plans to, I, th I think, you know, in, I mean, it's fair to say that CEC has been a partner in this the whole time. They've opened up the docket to collect the uh, comments thus far. And I think what the plan will be is they're going to, you know, have all the comments and that we will, you know, they'll transfer those to Boehm and we'll take them into consideration and we will have a 
I believe we're going to have an appendix to a document that we already have on the website, and so everyone will be able to see, you know, condensed down and the analysis done on the comments that we get during this comment period. And I don't want to steal too much thunder from the CEC, but I, that's it for BOEM at this time. All right. Thank you, Doug. Uh, this is Eric again. So before we move on to the, the update on the CEC notice of availability, just wanted to ask, uh, are there any other agency working group members um, uh, who would like to fold in again? And uh, final words before we wrap up this item? Yeah, this is this is Greg Haas with Congressman Carbajal's office again. Just just to wrap up, it, this is a, a, a process that um, the congressman is committed to, to seeing through. Um, there may be legislative remedies. There may be other possibilities to help assist with finding a location and something that's compatible. But you know, we are focusing on an area. You know, it. it, it the Central Coast has a particular infrastructure available, um, both currently through the Morro Mor Bay Power Plant or former Morro Bay Power Plant, uh, with its transmission lines, and, and expect to have even more access to uh, the state grid uh, with the eventual closure of Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant in 2025. So. Uh, you know, it, it looks like a potential for renewable energy off our coastline is here, and he wants to see what can be done to find the most compatible uh, locations for building and something that's viable that helps the state, uh, helps uh, the Central Coast, but also meets the needs of the uh, military who have significant assets in our area. Thanks, Eric. Okay, thanks a lot, Craig. So, so I see that we have a hand raised, but what I'd like to propose that we do is that we have, we hear the update from the, the California Energy Commission on their notice of availability, receive that, and then we'll move into the task force discussion. And so, Estelle, I see your hand up, but please, we're going to hold off until we get until the full task force discussion topic uh, before we start going through those. You'll, you'll be first there. So, so with you. that, I'd like to transition to, to Misa Werner from the CEC to provide the update on the Commission's Notice of Availability. I'll move the slides over for you. Thank you. If I can have the next slide, please. This is Misa Werner from the Energy Commission, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, the state and BOEM's process for um, receiving input on the, the areas that have been previewed just a few uh, slides ago. Um, we're well set up to receive your input, and we're going to be having some outreach opportunities here that I'm going to talk to you about and um, show you where to get information uh, that you've seen today and um, how to submit comments and the like. So um, as others mentioned, we did release a notice of availability on February 7th, and that was entitled Outreach and on Additional Considerations for Offshore Wind Off the Central Coast of California. That was filed to our docket for this process, and I'll show you in a minute where you can get that. A lot of the information that's already been uh, discussed as far as the background and the map that was just shown is in that filing. Um, next item in this uh, table takes us to today, our uh, task force webinar. And uh, the remaining items are what's planned at this point. Um, we're going to have an informational presentation to the Big Sur Multi-Agency Advisory Council on March 20th. And then there will uh, be, we'll be another informational presentation to Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council on April 17th. Uh, we're hoping to plan a, a public workshop on the Central Coast in the spring, early summer timeframe. And we're going to get the word out about that through our offshore energy listserv, which I'll show you how to join in just a minute here. Uh, we also have other informational meetings planned um, that are going to be scheduled in the future. And um, so those would be with tribal governments, and we may schedule additional informational meetings with specific stakeholder groups. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is just um, 
a shot of our offshore renewable energy web page. The URL is at the top there. Um, you can get there uh, a number of different ways on our website, but the quickest way is to go energy.ca.gov forward slash offshore dash renewable energy. And there's a number of, uh, you, you, you can see lots of other resources on here, but what I wanted to point out to you is in the red box, uh, there's a direct link to our docket log, which is where we file uh, notices, information, public comments are in there. You can look through, presentations are in there. Um, and so you can, if you're not familiar with those materials, you can review them there. Um, for example, the presentation from today will be posted in there later. Um, and then right underneath it is a direct link to submit comments to the docket. Um, so if I can have the next slide, please, I will show you what it looks like when you click, thank you, to, on the docket log. It's just a, a listing of all the documents filed, but this is particularly important to show you the red box, which is where um, you can find the notice of availability with um, all of this information that we're going over today. Um, next slide, please. So if uh, we're welcoming public comments on um, the meeting today is, and also on the materials in the notice of, avail of availability, right now we have a tentative deadline of May 15th. Uh, we will push that deadline out if, depending on when that Central Coast Public Workshop is scheduled. And um, we encourage you to use our e-commenting system. There's a link there uh, that will take you right to this docket. Or again, you can go to our uh, the Energy Commission's Offshore Renewable Energy page, and there's a Submit Comments link there on the right-hand side. If you'd like to email a comment, you can do that too to our dockets unit. Just make sure that you include the docket number, 17 miscellaneous 01 and offshore renewable energy in the subject line. And we also have a snail mail option there listed for you. So uh, one more slide, please. I want to uh, let everybody know how to stay informed with this process. We have a dedicated offshore energy list server at the Energy Commission. BOEM also has a list server. I wanted to show you how to get on ours uh, in case you weren't familiar with it. If further down our website, there's uh, just a box where you type in your information. Um, the system will send you confirmation. Make sure that you want to be on there. Make sure you execute the instructions in that email, and then you are signed up. So at that point, you'll get um, any uh, meeting notices uh, and anything that we send out on the list server, things that are docketed uh, to this docket actually do get sent out to the list server too. So you'll get those alerts as well. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Okay, this is uh, Eric Ponce, Crimson West. We're going to move on to the uh, our next agenda item, which is the time we've set aside for task force discussion. We, we invite task force members to, to weigh in on uh, some of the presentations that we've heard today, including the, the work of the agency uh, work group and, and uh, other public involvement opportunities. Um, so a, a couple of uh, quick introductions for how we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to be unmuting everyone uh, on the call again at this point, um, uh, but reminding folks that this discussion opportunity is intended for task force members only. And we uh, invite task force members to go to the raise hand function in the top middle part of the webinar screen in order to get into the queue. And so we have Estelle who will start us when we get there. Um, you also have the opportunity to uh, type questions into the, the Q&A pod at the bottom of the screen too if you would like to, to use that. And uh, Samantha will be uh, watching those. Uh, finally, uh, when we uh, invite task force members to speak, want to ask you each to just start by saying your name and affiliation so everyone can help track. And then uh, everybody, just to help uh, control the background noise, uh, since we are taking all the phones off of you, if, if, uh, please put yourselves on mute uh, in individually at this point so we can limit the background noise. So, so with that, I'm going to, uh, again, ask folks who want to get in the queue, please hit the raise hand icon. And uh, Sam, if you can make sure everybody's unmuted, we're going to start with uh, Estelle Fennell from Humboldt County. Uh, Estelle, you're, you're first. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Um, the 
the big thing for me is, uh, of course, the North Coast. And I know that a lot of this discussion today is about the Central Coast. So I had three uh, minor questions, a uh, very uh, small one here about the comments. The comments you referenced, are they just for the Central Coast um, projects? Uh, then uh, I had a question about uh, the 20 miles out uh, going down to 15, uh, the reasoning for that, and uh, how far out from there it would go, because we've been talking a lot about 25 miles. And then thirdly, uh, one of the first uh, discussion items you had was about the placement of buoys, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. You said it's going to be in April or May, and I believe that would also be in the North Coast. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Estelle. Um, uh, Lisa, could you maybe respond to her first question and invite other uh, task force members to respond to the other questions too? Sure, this is Lisa from the Energy Commission. Um, so the docket is open for comments at any time. We were encouraging specifically by that, um, you know, the target date, the May 15th uh, comments specifically on the notice of availability that we put out on the Central Coast areas. But we do welcome comments at any time to our docket. Thanks. Thank you. And, and Estelle, just to help remind of the second and third questions, just to make sure we're getting to those. Oh, thank you very much. I didn't want to take up too much time. I just had a quick question about the, the 20 mile uh, going down to 15 miles from shore. Um, and just reminding myself of our discussions, we're looking at 25 miles. So I'm just wondering uh, if you could explain a little bit why you moved it in. Is that just for the central coast? And also, um, uh, you know, what the, the, the further out uh, boundary line would be? So Estelle, this is Karen Douglas um, with the Energy Commission. Just to respond on your question about distance from shore, for, first of all, these uh, areas that we've put out for public input don't change anything about the call areas that were formally created through the BOEM process. So it doesn't change anything on the North Coast um, to directly answer your question. Um, the reason why these areas that we have asked for comment on go closer to shore is that the task force was attempting to find possibilities for commercial scale offshore wind that were as compatible as possible with DOD activities. And um, it was looking for additional areas for consideration that hadn't been included in the initial initial call and that were potentially more compatible with DOD activities that caused the Central Coast task force discussions to hone in on the um, areas we're asking for comment on now. And so other members of the working group can add to that if they'd like, but that hopefully helps you see what... No, that Okay. No, that's great, Karen. Uh, appreciate it. I kind of thought that was what it was, but I wanted to clarify it. Thank you. And and then the other uh, question was more a curiosity one in terms of uh, the boys going out, and um, they were going to be in April or May. And uh, just wanted to know what that would look like in terms of letting the public know. Well, and this is Doug from Boom, and so we have contracted with the Pacific Northwest National Lab. So they're actually Department of Energy owned buoys. And in order to increase the value of the uh, potential leases off the North Coast and the Central Coast, uh, you know, we're going to deploy those buoys for a year. Uh, I will say that, you know, it's going through the permitting process. We're close. I do think that it may be delayed on deployment until June or July instead of April or May. Uh, but I, we expect that it's going to be deployed, you know, this summer and that we'll collect a year's worth of data uh, so that we can increase the value of any offshore wind. And, you know, not to mention our other partners at the National Renewable Energy Lab would love to verify with real-time data, you know, the models that they've done for the, uh, <clears throat> for the wind assessment that they've done offshore in the Pacific. Thank you. Great. That's great. 
appreciate that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Estelle, for your questions. Uh, next up in the queue, and Estelle, if you can put your hand down, we have the City of Morro Bay. Uh, who would like yes, to uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, John Henning, Mayor, City of Morro Bay. Uh, um, first, I want to just comment, thank you, uh, Greg Haas and uh, Congressman Carbajal, for your leadership in working through the DOD issue. We appreciate the update and all of the work that's been done there. Steve Chung and Ron Tickle, thank you for your um, engagement there as well. Obviously, the City of Morro Bay remains um, um, extremely interested in finding a solution for um, the development of a project. A couple of comments on the proposed map, um, and maybe industry leaders will weigh in later, but it appears that um, the considerations of the north and the southerly areas include areas that are outside of the original Morro Bay call area. My understanding that if you should um, end up with a potential project outside of the original call area, that the BOEM process um, starts all over again and there may be a significantly um, additional time added to the process. So I'd like to get maybe some comments from BOEM on that first. Secondarily, um, in talking with industry leaders, it's my understanding that a viable project probably um, is a contiguous area of about 125 square miles. And um, the way I look at the map um, with regard to not only the discussion area, which presents sanctuary issues, but the northerly and the southerly uh, considerations for additions, um, those um, seem to be less than scale size projects, and I would raise a concern about that, but again, I'll defer to possibly industry to uh, uh, give input at the end when you have public comment with regard to that. The, the third piece of this for us also is um, if um, you're looking at areas outside of that original call area, there will be significant impact potentially locally here on fisheries, and our, our Fishing um, organization locally is concerned about that and um, will probably weigh in during public comment, but I just wanted to note that. And, and lastly, um, we've asked a number of times because we feel it's extremely important for whatever industrial partner um, we potentially might end up with that um, there be significant engagement in the community and we've asked uh, BOEM on a number of occasions to comment and consider um, using a multi-factor lease auction process, not just a uh, process that awards it to the highest bidder, to ensure that local community or other inputs and interests are reflected in the competitive process. And so that would be my final question with regard to that and a potential consideration for that in the Morro Bay um, area of Central California that you're looking at. Thank you. All right, thanks, John. This is Eric. So let's, let's, I'm not sure I caught all of them, but look, since uh, you had a number of questions, let's go back one at a time. So the first one was a question about timing intended for BOEM primarily. Yeah, so my, my first question really is if, if indeed um, you identify areas that are acceptable to DOD um, and BOEM that are outside of the original Morro Bay call area, that um, the BOEM process will be significantly extended because it will, in my words, have to start over again. Um, true or false, and, and if true, um, what's the additional timing uh, that will be required? So, so hey, Dr. G, hey, yeah, this is Doug. Hey, hey, Mayor Heading, how are you doing? Uh, <clears throat> just wanted to say, doing well, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I've thought about this question a lot. Uh, you know, we've discussed it before. Uh, I can say that we're at the beginning of the process now. Uh, you know, one of the things, you know, that BOEM has to be cautious of, if there are additional areas and we haven't gone out with a Federal Register notice previously, you know, we want to make sure that we're not leaving any stone unturned. Uh, so, you know, if we went out with another call, would it add time? I would say it would add some time, but it would just be the call process. But I think that, you know, as we're moving through this in the working group working together, if we identify some areas, uh, you know, that really it's not a significant amount of time that would be added and we would forego everyone the opportunity to go through an official, you know, boom, Federal Register notice 
public input process as we move forward with leasing on the Central Coast. Uh, and, and quite honestly, you know, we don't know what the final area is going to be. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Uh, but I think to answer your question, it's not going to add a significant amount of time to the process. Because as you, and I, I think I wrote down your questions, the next question I had was, uh, you know, the areas, the north and south, it's safe to say that those areas are not large enough for a full-scale commercial project, which I believe is what, you know, the city of Morro Bay and, you know, Congressman Carbajal's intent was that we wanted to have find some areas that were compatible with our partners at DOD, uh, but still afforded enough area to move forward with the viable uh, industry for offshore wind and you know as stated previously we've got the you know the <clears throat> the Morro Bay power plant with you know approximately one gigawatt and we've got the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant which is going to you know make three gig or two gigawatts uh, so we've been looking for you know an area three to five gigawatts on the central coast um, it's safe to say that we're not quite there yet and I think you know we're in the beginning of the process now to make sure that uh, you know we know where the public is, as because our you know when those call areas came out, they were 20 miles from shore. And now we're looking at 15, so we want to make sure that you know we want to be comfortable as we're moving forward uh, to make sure that the you know 15 is going to be something you know we wanted to hear comments on sooner rather than later. Great. And uh, just the other question, maybe, Doug, while you're there, is the multi-factor lease auction process. We've mentioned it a number of times, including uh, we met with your folks last week in Washington. Thank you for that. But just wondering um, what your current comments are with regard to that. You know, I, I can say that the multi-factor process, you know, we have used it in lease sales in the past. It is a part of Boehm's regulations. Uh, you know, and we're, I'll say, you know, once we find areas and we can move forward, you know, that, that will be something that we'll consider as we move through the competitive leasing process. Uh, so it's a very real, you know, we appreciate the comments. You know, it's something that we've heard before, uh, and it's something that Boehm can take a look at as we move forward uh, with the leasing process. But I think now it's, you know, we're focusing on finding the areas off the Central Coast to make sure that you know, we get something that's appropriate for leasing that works well for industry, for Boehm, as well as Department of Defense and the state. Great, Doug. Thank you. So. Yeah, there's one other question in there, John, that you mentioned just about concerns of the fishing interests in the area. Yeah, Doug, and the, you... local, the local, yeah, maybe I could just repeat that. Our, our local fishing industry um, um, individuals and organizations have uh, basically um, evaluated the Morro Bay call area, and there's been some, um, in my term, mitigation with a potential partner um, here for impacts that would occur. And uh, I, I would just want to be sure um, if there's anything outside of that existing call area that we're taking, uh, you're taking significant inputs from fishing, uh, local fishing industry representatives to ensure that they are, are uh, have an adequate um, opportunity to vet the potential impacts that might occur for anything outside of, again, the existing call area. And I just wanted to add, Mr. Mayor, that, you know, really, and that's kind of what I was trying to get to in my roundabout way earlier, is that, you know, if we did have an area outside of the current call area that you know, to make sure that everyone has heard that, that official Federal Register notice to not necessarily start the process again, but just to make sure that we're taking everyone into consideration uh, with that official process of ours for any additional areas, if that makes sense. It does, Doug. Thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. All right. John, thank you for those questions, and, and Doug, thanks for the responses. Uh, we've received a, a question from uh, Michael Winkler from the City of Arcata Task Force member, and he asks, has Boehm yet set a tentative date for when the formal bid process will start for the Humboldt Bay area? And this is Doug again. You know, I can say that you know, we're looking at the North Coast. Uh, I mean, it's obvious to say that there are less DOD concerns on the North Coast. 
in the Humboldt Coal area. Uh, we're still evaluating and going through the lease or going through the the process. Uh, you know, area identification is our next stage. Uh, once we have an area identified, you know, we'll designate it as a wind energy area and move forward with the NEPA process for uh, consideration of leasing of the area, the wind energy area. Uh, it, timing is a little up in the air. I mean, I can say that it's something that we're working on. Uh, and, you know, again, with our state partners at CEC, uh, you know, and the federal government making sure that we're making the right decisions and moving forward appropriately. Uh, but I can't pin down a time on the North Coast right now. Michael, does that help with your question? Any, any follow-up on that? Okay. So I'm going to go to the, the next hand up, uh, Jan Agani, and if you could introduce yourself and your affiliation on the task force. Hi there, this is Jan Aganian, and um, I represent the Blue Lake Rancheria Tribal Government here on the far north coast of California. And I guess I'll just um, tag on to Mr. Winkler's comment. Um, we just want to urge BOEM and, um, and all of the stakeholder agencies to really look at taking the next steps in the Humboldt Call area. So defining that wind and energy area, um, preparing the um, EA and, and other environmental um, documents as needed. You know, this region is already um, well underway in terms of planning um, and seeking out funding for things like transmission and port upgrades. Um, we've got a very strong kind of community engagement um, that's been going on for the last three years. These projects take a long time, but as you mentioned, there are um, uh, there are very few DOD conflicts in this area. So I'll just end my comments there with saying any um, forward movement in the Humboldt Bay area um, would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. So, Mr. CC, any comments on that? This is Estelle I'll, Fennel. Uh, may I speak? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Estelle, well, hold up. I wanted to see if uh, there was a response to the, the previous comment from John Agassi oh, from, from Bomer others. And, and Estelle, we have one more before you. Okay, thank you. And this is Doug again, just saying that, you know, we have heard loud and clear, uh, you know, the <clears throat> from the North Coast, and it's something that we do take into consideration. Uh, you know, I just, we're hoping to have something soon. I just can't commit to anything now. So, but we have heard and we're doing our best to move forward. Okay, thanks Doug and thank you, Jana, for your, your comment. So uh, next in the queue is the Coastal Commission. Who do we have? Hi, this is Kate Hubblebridge with the Coastal Commission. Um, and I just have a very fast comment. I wanna first of all thank the working group for getting together and trying to keep things moving on the Central Coast. Um, I think at the Coastal Commission, we have um, some potential concerns that bringing um, areas farther inshore could result in additional impacts to fishing and biological resources, and especially to public views. Um, we don't have enough information yet um, to really make that assessment, so we're looking forward to kind of getting into the data and seeing really what, um, what the difference makes um, by bringing further inshore. But we really are looking forward to hearing from the public um, fishing community um, and others to hear their, their views. And I guess the one question I had was to ask whether there was any um, effort being made to look at view analysis. Um, I know that BOEM has a, has a project that they've been working on that we've discussed, that Gene discussed earlier about um, view shed analysis from different places on Central and North Coast. That was with the original um, more of I think more Bay call area, are there any efforts in place to do some sort of comparative analysis um, with um, these further inshore areas, whether from Hearst Castle or from Big Sur or other um, potentially um, sensitive view shed areas? Okay, thanks Kate, for that question. Uh, Jean Thurston, was this a good question for you? Oh, that's a great question for me. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thank you, Kate. 
Um, yeah, so we are doing a second set of visualizations, uh, and the, this set is going to include Julia Pfeiffer State Park, Lime Kiln State Park, and Valencia Peak in Montaño de Oro State Park. Um, and I have the lats and longs for you if you want, Kate. I can send them up to you. But for uh, Julia Pfeiffer, it's off of Tin House Road, and then we're going to use Pitkin Curve Overlook. Um, which is at Lime Kiln State Park. And the distance from shore that we're looking at is going to be 15, 17, and 20 miles from shore for each one of those viewpoints. We're also doing an additional 15, 17, and 20 from Piedras Blancas, which was in the original set of three KOPs, or the key observation points, in the first BOEM viewshed analysis study that um, I sent you the link for and the uh, visuals for that. Uh, this is Kate again. Yeah, if you could send me the new um, locations, I would definitely appreciate it. And thank you for getting right on that. Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. Back thank to you, Kate, it. and thank you. thank you for that response. Uh, Estelle, then you're back in the queue again. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry to, to be all over this, but I did want to just very quickly um, exercise that concept of the greasy wheel or squeaky wheel, whatever, um, and just to reiterate what Jana and Michael said, uh, we're very anxious to move forward as much as possible in uh, Humboldt County. Got a lot of support um, both from the county and the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, so anything you can do to move it along would be greatly appreciated, and thank you. Okay, thanks, Estelle. And uh, yeah, someone just may have gone on hold and left some music. So please, everyone, if you're not speaking, please make sure that you're on mute. So are, are there others who would like to get in the queue? I, I don't see any other hands raised right now. And uh, Sam, do you have any other Q&A questions? No other questions from Task Force members uh, in the pod at this time. Okay, thanks. Yes, I hear a voice. If you could uh, announce yourself. Um, Russ Vetter with NOAA Fisheries. Um, I'm just on the phone driving, uh, so I had to butt in here. But uh, okay, go ahead, Russ. So in federal fisheries, Magnus and Stevens and ESA, Environmental Protection Act, that all funnels through the Pacific Fishery Management Council process with along with California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So my question is, have you given a presentation to one of the council meetings? So this is Jean Thurston with, with BOEM. Yeah, we've, we've presented to the Habitat Committee um, twice. Uh, we have not this past year, um, but we have been in communication with the Habitat Committee, and we've been working with um, Eric Wilkins, who is on that committee. OK, thank you. OK, th thanks, Russ, for that question and for, for driving carefully. Um, do we have any other uh, questions or comments coming from task force members? Please raise your hand, or, or if you can't do so, uh, you can jump in right now. So I'm, I'm not hearing any other uh, requests for uh, task force members to speak during this discussion period. So uh, Jean is the coordinator. If it's okay with you, I think we'll move on to the next steps. And uh, we'll, we'll wrap up uh, with the next steps and closing comments for the formal task force meeting. And then we'll move perhaps a, a, a tad early into the, into the uh, public uh, uh, input opportunity. Uh, so with that, I guess I will ask, um, I guess I would ask uh, Sam if you could uh, put everybody else back on mute again during these final two segments. And and, uh, and then Jean Thurston Keller would like to invite you back as the task force coordinator to talk about the next steps. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, so for next steps, I identified Four key steps, um, and 
I'll have Karen and Doug, who will be doing the closing remarks, add in case there's anything that I missed. Um, but right now I'm looking at, we want to make sure that we distribute information and notices um, for the Ocean Protection Council's upcoming offshore wind workshop that will be on the North Coast. So BOEM is continuing to coordinate with OPC on that. Uh, the approximate date for that will be April 28th. And we'll make sure that everyone, uh, all the task force members, are notified of that workshop. It is open to the public. We'll also be continuing to coordinate with the California Energy Commission on public workshop dates that we mentioned in the next, uh, next steps for public outreach. And also, for number three, I have keep the public informed of every opportunity to participate in this process. We want to make sure that we have public input on those areas that we've identified, or the, the working group has identified, I should say. Um, so we want to make sure that the public has every opportunity to be informed of that. And then finally, for our public outreach, we'll make sure that we get the view shed simulations that we have being uh, done right now uh, out to the public, and we'll make sure to communicate that. So with that, those are the items that, that I have, and I'll hand it back over to, to Eric and um, for some closing remarks from Karen and Doug. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Jean. And so I um, want to move on to the closing remarks right now. And All right, here I so like I'll kick off the closing remarks. This is uh, Karen Douglas again. I just wanted to thank the task force members, um, both Central Coast and North Coast and, and state and federal agencies for participating in this webinar and um, also appreciate the public participation. We have something like over 300 people, I think, participating in this webinar, which is a uh, fantastic uh, turnout and participation. We'll look forward to hearing from um, stakeholders and the public in just a few moments. Doug? No, I second that. I can't believe that there weren't more questions for us, but I think that, you know, with the uh, substantial public interest that, you know, we'll have a lot of, a lot of, a lot more comments and questions back and forth, so look forward to that. I did want to thank everyone for being a part of this. Again, thanks to Gene and Eric at the Kearns and West team. Uh, you know, I, I know we've talked about public meetings coming up. Um, it would be I would be remiss to say that you know, of course, public health and safety is utmost importance to you know us on the Fed side and on the state side too. So you know, as things develop, you know, we'll make sure that uh, we plan accordingly. So if things do change, please keep in mind that we're doing it out of the best interest for everyone. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Commissioner Douglas. Well, D Doug's last remark just uh, made me think as well, and we thought we would get this question. The, the outreach plan that we um, have posted and discussed today uh, is something that we, ha you know, we intend to go through. However, there are um, obviously with the coronavirus issue, some potential changes and to the extent that those affect the outreach, we will just um, do outreach as well as we can. We appreciate the um, webinar attendance here. It looks like um, this event at the very least was very successful at getting widespread public participation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Karen and, and Doug. So this is Eric Fonsley, Kearns and West. We are now reaching the end of the, the formal task force meeting, and we wanted to move to uh, the public comment opportunity or public input opportunity, and, and just recognizing the time, I'm wondering if, if folks might appreciate a, a five minute or so break before we move into that next, uh, into that next segment. So, uh, Sam, if you can unmute folks, would, would, would it be helpful to, for a break, or do people want to just move straight into that? Five minutes would be great. I, I would second that, and it makes it easier to have the official close of the meeting, so a five-minute break would be great.
Okay, perfect. So it's at, at uh, 10.40 Pacific time right now. Uh, I'm going to just say let's pause for five minutes, and we will reconvene at uh, 10.45. And at that point, we will be uh, inviting uh, members of the public to, to raise their hands, get in the queue, so we can uh, address and, and to address your questions and also hear your comments. And, and I want to greatly encourage task force members to, to continue to, to stay on the line and participate in this uh, public comment opportunity to, to be able to hear the, the concerns of stakeholders and also to be able to help respond to questions as appropriate. So we'll take a, a five minute break and, and we'll reconvene at 1045. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Are others on the line and can you hear me? This is Eric Ponsley, Crimson West. We're moving into the public input opportunities. I can hear you, Eric. Yeah. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, so welcome back. So I'm going to jump quickly to the next slide and let me know if folks can see that. So, no, we still just the task force discussion. Okay, S Sam, could you advance to the, the process guidelines, please? Yes, I've advanced. Can you see that? Okay, can, can folks see the process guideline slide? Not yet. It's We're there the now. Next step it's slide. You're okay. on next step. All right. Can can folks see the process guideline slide now? No, you're on next step. Okay. Well, I, it, it looks like we're having uh, version control issues here with uh, it showing up differently on different screens. And apologies for that. I'm going to read the. Uh, the process guidelines slide, and please someone let me know if it pops up here, uh, just to give everybody instructions for how to, to, to uh, how we're going to run this part of the, of the the meeting. And here, uh, uh, basically, oh, I, Sam, I wanted to ask you to, to invite you to take a look at the, the public participation poll we invited folks to fill out at the beginning to let us know who's actually on the line right now, and and uh, I don't know. If, you can just read the general percentages or numbers from the different stakeholder categories. Sure. I will go back to the introductory slide where we had our poll at the bottom left. Um, so the question asked for non-task force members, please indicate your affiliation. We have 6% tribal government, 11% uh, federal agency, 9% state agency, 1% local government, nearly 2% elected official, uh, nearly 2% fish, or sorry, nearly 7% fishing interests, 6% conservation groups, 21.5% um, offshore wind industry, and 4% academic or research institution, 25% consulting firm, uh, nearly 2% is interested member of the public, and 6% is indicated as other. Okay, so just a, a high-level overview of who we have on the call, so thank you all for, for participating. Uh, during this, uh, the, this public input opportunity section, uh, we're going to be inviting folks to raise your hand, as some of you have already done, and, and also invite you to uh, share questions uh, or, or comments via text, which some of you are doing too, and, and uh, Crimson West will read those to everyone in order. Um, when, when you do have the opportunity to speak, please share your name and affiliation so everyone can hear who it is. And, and we have a, an, an hour plus for this, and so we were going to, if folks have comments, we were going to ask you to limit to, to two to three minutes max and, and to just be respectful of everyone's time and making sure that we can fit everybody in here. I, I feel pretty confident that we can do that on this call. Um, if there are questions asked by members of the public, we would, we're would we going to invite uh, task force members to weigh in and answer them as best they can. Um, again, to get in the queue to speak, please, it's probably the easiest thing to do is to hit the raise hand icon at the uh, top middle of your webinar. Um, uh, finally, if uh, since all, all the phone lines are, are now open, um, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. And then uh, just a final reminder to everybody that there, there, there is the, the CEC notice uh, public comment opportunity that's taking place right now so that if you uh, remember something that you didn't get to, to ask or, or comment during this call, there are additional opportunities to, to share that. Uh, finally, the, the Crimson West team and other staff are capturing the questions and comments that we're hearing. Uh, during this meeting and that we will be sharing these with the, the California Energy Commission to be incorporated into their uh, existing public comment opportunity. 
Okay, so so that's the, the background. At this point, I uh, want to get to the queue, and we're going to start with uh, Mike Conroy followed by Michael Jacobson, and then I have a couple of comments uh, coming in from the, the Q&A. We'll, we'll then hear uh, red comments from Caitlin Barnes and Anthony Barrow, and then we'll go back to the queue again. So let's start with Mike Conroy. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks. Yeah, my name is Mike Conroy. I work with a number of commercial and charter boat fisheries that operate in and around the uh, Central Coast call areas. I have a few comments and then some questions. Um, I'd just like to start off by thanking you for the opportunity to comment on this important item. Um, I know we've been tracking it for quite a while now. Um, I'll get more into that a little bit later. I would like to note that I think having public comment after the close of the meeting kind of seems a little bit inappropriate. It's I don't know if there's a reason why the meeting couldn't be closed after the receipt of public comment, but I'll leave that just as the comment. Um, I will also note there was, a, I believe it was the mayor from Morro Bay had spoke about fishing interest in his location, which are supportive of the uh, efforts here. I will note that there are other fishing interests outside of Morro Bay that are going to be impacted by these call areas who haven't been heard or engaged in the process. Uh, we made note of it in our comment that we, we submitted last January on the ori original bone call areas. So any efforts that can be done to engage with fisheries that actually use the areas that are proposed to be designated for wind energy would be uh, very helpful. Um, with regards to whether this has been presented before the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, no, it is not. I know it has been submitted to the Habitat Committee, but it has not been uh, shown before the entire council, and I would implore you to do that sooner than later. Um, with regards to the working group that was set up by Congressman Carvajal, I note that NOAA, neither NOAA nor National Marine Fisheries Service are part of that working group. I would highly recommend that you bring them in. Um, with regards to the uh, the buoys that I believe you said were going to be going in in April of this year, I assume that the buoy locations have been coordinated through National Marine Fisheries Service because I know there's a lot of important stir surveys that inform stock assessments and things like that that are that take place in those areas. And it would be unfortunate if one of their long-standing transect lines had to be moved because the buoy was placed right in the middle of that. Uh, and then I also note that there was a statement that, Car uh, that Congressman Carball had met with stakeholders. Um, my question would be which stakeholders? Um, as representative of fisheries that use the areas, I wasn't aware that there was a meeting with stakeholders with Congressman Carball, so clearly the interests of the Albuquerque fleets and the other fleets that use those areas were not considered. And then with the same thing, you know, with regard to the agency working group, definitely want to implore the, uh, you all do include National Marine Fisheries as part of that. And that concludes my comment. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Mike. And, and here I want to just ask that maybe Jean to step in and talk about the, the task force meeting and how public comment fits into that, provide a little clarity there. So is Jean Thurston on? So, sure, sure. So okay, um, so we'll address the, the public comment after the close of the meeting. So um, we are not a FACA committee, which means that uh, it is strictly for governmental bodies to meet uh, in the formal meeting, and uh, members of the public uh, have the opportunity to attend and to listen to these meetings but they cannot participate directly in the government discussion. That's why we have the opportunities at the end of every meeting, um, and we capture the, the comments that have been made, such as the ones you've you, you made today, Mike. And we'll, um, we're going to continue to coordinate uh, with the California Energy Commission and with our, our task force partners to make sure that we have all opportunities for public comment that although you cannot participate directly in the task force discussion, that your voice is heard by the task force members. 
And Thanks. Michael, this is Karen Douglas. I just wanted to add that um, this organizational structure is part of the reason why the Energy Commission is collecting comments through our docket in coordination with BOEM so that um, written comments can come to us and we'll work with BOEM to um, compile those comments and we will um, be submitting them to BOEM so that there is a process for um, the more formal type of pub public commenting that, that you would want. Makes sense. Thanks, uh, Jean and Karen. And, and uh, Mike, I hope that at least helps to answer the question about how, why this meeting is structured as it is with the, the public input opportunity at the end. So let's go to the, the next person in the queue. This is Michael Jacobson. So please introduce your, yourself and any affiliation. Uh, Mike Jacobson, are you on? So I'm not hearing Mike, so let, let's keep him in the queue and we have a couple of questions that I can read right now. So the, the first one um, is coming from Caitlin Barnes and she asks that, that she heard a reference to NEPA but not to CEQA and would CEQA be completed for onshore infrastructure? Is there a task force member who would like to respond to that? Sure, this is Jean with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. So for um, any project that would go in, um, there would be NEPA and CEQA, but that would be for a project-specific plan, um, which would be after a lease sale or auction, which is um, much farther down the road. But yes, we would comply with not only the National Environmental Policy Act, but also uh, the California Environmental uh, Act as well for project-specific. Anything that came to shore would be considered a, a connection act, connected action. Um, so that is something that would be would be analyzed under um, CEQA as well as NEPA. Okay, great, Gene. Thank you for that. So I have another question coming from Anthony Barrow, and he asks why the recommended areas North A and South B are so close to the National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, this will invite commercial fishermen to fish in these uh, areas close to the sanctuary. Um, how will we track to ensure regulated protection of the sanctuary? A task force member can respond. This yeah, this is Bill is... Duros from the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Maybe I'll at least take a stab at that. Um, Part of why we've been participating is to understand overall what the effects of any project are going to be. Just because a project's not proposed within a marine sanctuary doesn't mean there couldn't possibly be impacts within the marine sanctuary. And, and thus, I think from our perspective, it's just too early to tell because uh, it ultimately depends on the design of the project and um, where they're going to lay the proposed to lay the power cables. There's typically, as I've seen in past documents, a floating substation. Where will that go? Um, how far the anchors will extend from the floating platforms? So there's there's still an awful lot of information still to come, but uh, our presumption within NOAA is that that's all going to come within the broader sanctuary process. And, and just because I'm talking now and just maybe more efficient, I, I just want to flag that um, I made a presentation last week to the Pacific Fishery Management Council itself, as well as the Habitat Committee. And I did explain to them, <clears throat> both the Habitat Committee and the Council, that this meeting was going on today and encouraged them to listen in. Um, and I think, as I saw earlier, I think there is at least one or two representatives from the Council staff um, on the call, uh, or at least on the earlier version. Uh, but I, I, as well, I don't think there's been an overall presentation to the Council itself. That's all I got. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, anyone else want to, from the task force want to weigh in on the question about consideration of the National Marine Sanctuary for for those uh, areas, North A and South B? Yeah, Eric, this is Doug. I'll take a quick stab at it. You know, I, I think, you know, the working group, uh, you know, we did come up with these areas. Ultimately, we came up with the areas uh, 
because they look like they may be more compatible with DOD operations. Uh, but as you know, our partners at NOAA Sanctuaries, you know, Bill Duros was has been involved in the meetings too. Uh, and as I think we go through the process, you know, we'll be able to analyze what the impacts are. Uh, you know, ultimately, as said earlier, Boehm has no authority to lease within the sanctuary. Uh, but you know, next to it, I think it's just. You know, it's where the wind is good, it's where the water depth is good, it's where there's industry interest, and ultimately it's where, you know, DOD may find areas that are compatible. So this is Karen. I will just add, um, just going back to the notice of availability that is on the Energy Commission website, um, there is some background information in there that helps describe this work as well. Um, the working group did not re-examine areas within the Diablo Car Canyon call area at this time. The group focused on areas proximate to and within the Morro Bay call area um, that may be compatible with DOD operations. And so just given the location of the Morro Bay call area in close proximity, obviously adjacent to the sanctuary, that also helps explain why these additional areas that are being provided for public input are near the sanctuary. Okay, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Doug, as well. So we're going to move into the queue. We have uh, Molly Krull. Molly, if you could introduce yourself, uh, name and uh, your affiliation, please. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Hi, this is Molly Kroll with the American Wind Energy Association of California. We appreciate the efforts of BOEM, the Department of Defense, NOAA, Con Congressman Carbajal, and Congressman Panetta, as well as the CEC, to move the discussions forward on potential locations for commercial offshore wind in Central California. We know that California will require roughly 150 gigawatts of additional renewables by 2050 to achieve its greenhouse gas goals. Offshore wind presents a tremendous opportunity to help supply some of this vast need while creating local economic development opportunities. But to get the full workforce benefit and drive local investment in ports and manufacturing, we need to take steps today to achieve and offshore wind industry at scale. That means long-term transmission planning and outside. taking advantage of the near-term opportunities for transmission capacity with the closure of Diablo Canyon. It also means Come moving on, forward outside. expeditiously toward commercial development in the current Boehm call areas in federal waters off both the north and central coast. We note that the new maps identify only about 80 square miles of non-contiguous Come on. space within the existing Boehm Mora Bay call area, which is not sufficient sea space to stimulate the development at scale of our emerging industry. The new discussion areas. Hey, hey, Molly, can, can I interrupt you for just a sec? Oh, just we're yeah, hearing sure. some background noise, and not everyone's on mute. <laughs> yes, I, I think there's a dog in the background somewhere. If, if folks could please go on mute if you're uh, not yet on mute, we'd greatly appreciate it. Okay, Thank sorry you. about that, Molly. Who's doing? No problem. Um, the new discussion areas closer to shore and outside the existing Mora Bay call area may also require a new BOEM call or other public process, process which we're concerned would further delay progress in the existing call area. So we urge BOEM and the state to prioritize negotiations with DOD to enable moving forward with an auction for the existing Mora Bay call area as soon as possible with sufficient sea space for multiple projects of at least one gigawatt each. This will enable the offshore wind energy or offshore wind to take advantage, as Doug Boring, Greg Haas, and the CEC have also noted of the transmission capacity available and soon to be available at both Diablo Canyon and Morro Bay. And it would put the industry on a path to achieving scale needed to support the state's greenhouse gas goals. In addition, we ask that the state agencies preserve the longer term development potential of what we consider to be the relatively limited technically developable area off the central coast, consisting of the Mora Bay call area and nearby areas not otherwise limited by sea slope, underwater cables, military training and testing areas, or the sanctuary. Preserving this additional opportunity specifically by avoiding the imposition of any long-term moratorium before DOD has had the opportunity to assess the actual impacts of wind turbines in the area is essential to creating an industry at scale for California. Finally, for the state as a whole to stand up an offshore wind industry at scale, 
at a scale of 10 gigawatts specifically, we advocate for BOEM and the state to advance toward commercial leasing within both the Morro Bay and Humboldt call areas. The ideal path forward is to proceed, proceed with leasing both areas <laughs> on the same time frame as quickly as possible. We appreciate the time and effort of the federal agencies in the state of California, and we thank you for engaging stakeholders. We look forward to continuing to work uh, with the task force toward future commercial lease sales in the state. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Molly, for your, your comments. I'll, I'll just pause, is there a, I don't know if there was a question in there, but any response in particular from task force members? Okay, thanks for that comment. Um, I, I, I note that uh, Michael Jacobson is back in the queue and we missed you before, so I will bump you to the front since you were there earlier. Do you have a, if you could uh, introduce yourself and affiliation? Is Michael Jacobson there? Okay, I, I see your hand raised. We'll try to come back to you later. Um, how about Ross Tyler, please? Please introduce yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So I'm Ross Tyler, and I'm with uh, RWE Renewables. And uh, I'm a, um, RWE Renewables is a developer, offshore wind developer. And my question is to Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, um, specifically about the floating LIDARs. And could um, somebody from Bureau of Ocean Energy Management confirm that the two floating LIDARs will, will go initially, one in the north area, which would be Humboldt, and the other one in, uh, off, uh, in, in the Morro Bay area? And if, uh, if that is correct, is there a formal have feedback from developers and other interested parties as to where within those areas um, the floating LIDARs sh should be situated? Thank you. Sure. This is, this is yes. Jean Thurston. I'll, I'll take a stab at that question. So yes, I can confirm that there will be two buoys. One will be in the Humboldt Bay call area and one will be in the Morro Bay call area. Um, and to answer your second question, we, we will not be asking for formal feedback on the exact location within those areas from developers. We're working with the Pacific Northwest National Lab and the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, to work on what those locations will be. And we're also talking with the United States Coast Guard to ensure it doesn't interfere with vessel traffic. So we appreciate the interest, uh, but we will not be taking uh, input from developers on those locations for that study. Thank you. Thank you, Ross, for the question and, and Jean for that response. Uh, next up is uh, Adam Stern. Please introduce yourself. Hi, this is Adam Stern from Offshore Wind, California. Can you hear me? Uh, yep, please go. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, we are a trade organization that represents offshore wind developers and technology companies. We want to express our gratitude to all the parties that have been involved in discussing uh, the plans and deliberations over proper spaces for offshore wind, and simply want to uh, augment the comments that Molly Kroll made, uh, which is to say that uh, we support, uh, as, as soon as possible, a leasing process that will enable California to take advantage of the benefits of offshore wind and just to observe that the spaces that the new spaces that have been identified on their own are insufficient to build the projects of uh, necessary size to take advantage of economies of scale and provide Californians with the full benefits of offshore wind, including clean energy, supply, jobs, and economic development. I was encouraged to hear from Commissioner Douglas that uh, she views these spaces as additional to the call areas that had already been identified, including the Morro Bay one. And we look forward to working with the state and the federal authorities to help advance the process of getting offshore wind sited in California. Okay, Adam, thank you very much for that comment. Um, I'm going to go back to the, the Q&A pod. You had a couple of other questions here that I'd like to read. We have a question from uh, Robert Piatti, who's 
uh, Salonen Tribal Council representative, and he asks, he says, I hear the concern for viewshed impacts, but the energy must come ashore. So I'd appreciate hearing what measures are being considered to help address these visual and physical impacts. So a question about how are visual and physical impacts associated with uh, view shed and, and energy coming ashore? Is this something that Task Force member can respond to? Yeah, this is Doug from Boom. I think I understand the question, but correct me if I'm wrong. So the first one is the visual impact, uh, and you know, as we stated, we're moving forward with our initial assessment of what could potentially be out there. Uh, but really, you know, once a, you know, once we find areas for leasing and the construction operation plan comes in, you know, that's when we're going to be able to do a visual analysis of what's actually being proposed. Also, in that construction operation plan is going to you know, when they're, <clears throat> when a developer is going to have their plan for bringing that power to shore. So for right now, you know, it's just in the leasing. You know, we have a conceptual that we're doing to inform our stakeholder outreach, uh, but we really won't know specifics until we have a lease and we have a lessee and the construction operation plan comes in. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of it will depend on, you know, where they tie in the shore is going to be, you know, where we find areas that are appropriate for leasing offshore. Uh, so, you know, that's coming in the future. You know, it's something that we're cognizant of now, uh, but that ultimately the real analysis of those impacts would be at the construction operation plan phase. Okay, th yeah, thanks for that. I think, yeah, he was interested in both in the visual impacts, but also the, the physical impacts of the tie-in onshore. So you're ad addressing that through the construction operation plan. Um, so we have so another Eric, this is, uh, oh, yeah. Eric, this is Karen, and, and I just wanted to say something and then maybe encourage uh, if any of the other state agencies on the uh, task force would like to speak to this. I think the one hard thing about our webinar format is we can't look at each other across the room to figure out who should answer a question, and so I think that's why sure. sometimes you get this sort of long pause after questions get asked. But I will say kind of generally, we're at a, uh, you know, in terms of these additional areas, the additional possible areas we've asked for comment on, we're at a very informal stage of the process um, where at a high level we'd like input. Um, thanks to BOEM, we'll be able to provide the public and stakeholders and uh, with visual simulations that'll be um, representative of those um, possible areas and um, of course there's a more form formal process that we just went through with the phone call and somebody's walking in the wind is what it sounds like all right and and then of course the there is a CEQA overview as well as a NEPA overview when we actually get to the permitting stage. And I just wanted to point that out. I think it's been pointed out before. I don't know if uh, State Lands or Coastal Commission want to add anything about their role on a shoreline interconnection, for example. Uh, this is Kate Hucklebridge with the Coastal Commission. Um, I'll just add very quickly that, that we um, have jurisdiction over a couple different phases, um, including the kind of first piece of it, which will be a um, consistency, federal consistency determination prior to the lease sale. Um, so we'll be looking sort of at a on a siting level scale on uh, on you know all coastal impacts and and thinking about um, siting of offshore wind and and potential impacts on coastal resources. And then farther down the line, um, if we get that, if we, as we move, if we do have a lease sale and move towards a project, the Coastal Commission would then also um, do another federal consistency action with a, with a, a project specific, at the project specific level, um, that it would, would include both the federal waters component, any cables going through state waters, and then potentially any onshore components. There's definitely 
um, several different state and local agencies that would likely be involved at that point. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kate. This is Jennifer Maddox from the California State Lands Commission. Just to add on that, um, and thanks for the question. Um, physical impacts from any kind of infrastructure that needs to cross from the site of the uh, facility to shore would uh, come through state waters, potentially, depending on the alignment, um, would be either under uh, the commission's jurisdiction or potentially a, a local uh, jurisdiction. And then, you know, there's, as you've seen, there's been a lot of interest in certain areas because of the availability of existing onshore infrastructure that could potentially be repurposed. So until there is, as Doug said, farther down when there is an actual uh, proposed project plan of construction, that will be the phase that those physical impacts through state waters uh, would be evaluated as part of the State Lands Commission's obligations under the California Environmental Quality Act and in close coordination with BOEM, Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, National Marine Fisheries Service, um, Coastal Commission, I think I said already, but you know, many, many agencies and uh, as well as the Ocean Protection Council who serves as our coordinating body on policy related to uh, offshore wind development. Okay, thank you, Kate. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, for following up there and for Karen for initiating that. Um, any, any final comments on that question about visual and physical impacts from task force members? Okay, um, I'm going to move on to the next question that came in through the chat box, but I want to note that, that we don't have any other hands up currently right now, so if there are members of the, the public who would like to ask a question or share a comment, please click the raise hand icon and we'll get you in the queue. Um, so the next question we have comes from Steve Scheiblauer and Steve asks, why isn't the Pacific Fishery Management Council represented on the task force? Hi, this is Jean. I can answer that question. So the Pacific Fisheries Management Council we have had uh, in the past, Eric Wilkins uh, has been on both. Um, and we have state agencies that are, participate in the Pacific Fisheries Management Council and also federal members that participate in the uh, Pacific Fisheries Management Council. And any of those members may join the task force. Uh, it's my understanding that they cannot represent the council itself on the task force. Um, and I think that has to do with the way that the council is actually set up. So. Um, we do have some overlap, but it is not a direct representation. Um, and we can address that probably more with the council in the future. Uh, this has come up uh, before as a discussion item. Uh, but we communicate regularly with the council, and we do talk with the heads of the committees. We are always open and available to come to the council and speak to the council. Uh, and answer any questions directly during a Pacific Fisheries Management Council meeting if we are so requested. Okay, thank you for that response. I'm gonna, we have next uh, Nancy Kirshner Rodriguez in the, in the queue with your hand raised. Uh, Nancy, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Nancy, are you available? I'm not hearing Nancy. She might be on mute. She may have left. But we have another question that has come in from Keith uh, Rootsart. And, and I'll read this one. It says, uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council, how much more wind energy is at the Humboldt Cull area compared to the Morro Bay Cull area? Besides the proximity to electrical infrastructure, what is the reason to consider developing development of 15 megawatt turbines 
uh, which are 10 times the nameplate of those in the Black Sea in a lower wind, uh, in a lower wind energy area. And it goes on, it would seem that wind turbines in Humboldt would have less windswept area and reduced visual and other impact. The infrastructure improvements should be a fraction of project cost. So does anyone from the council want to take that on? I'm the council, from the uh, task force want to take that on? I think it's a, a question about um, Just a question about having the larger 50 megawatt turbines being used in a lower wind energy area. This might be a very good question for the California Energy Commission related to uh, the transmission capabilities. I will say that the 15 megawatt that we used for a hypothetical wind farm for our viewshed analytics and simulations was based on a future um, wind turbine that hasn't been um, put into water yet. Uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab felt that that was a hypothetical turbine capacity that would be available in the future um, by the time we went through the leasing process and uh, construction and operations plan process for eventual development that you would probably see. So. A 15 megawatt turbine, although larger than what you would see in, say, the Black Sea, is because that's the direction we've been told by the National Renewable Energy Lab is um, where the future is moving. So with less turbines, they may be taller, uh, but you would need more space between them. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you would have a smaller space that you would you would use for um, those turbines. But I would probably take it over to the California Energy Commission to talk about um, the reasons why Humboldt Bay versus Morro Bay in terms of development, there's some uh, unique transmission considerations for those areas and differences. All right, thank you. Um, I think I understand the question as being, you know, why, what, what, what role does transmission play, availability play, in terms of the state looking at central coast versus north coast offshore wind? And um, I think the short answer to that is that um, availability of transmission infrastructure is, and and typically is, one of the most important driving factors for where renewable energy projects can go. Um, of course, we do um, strengthen the transmission system and sometimes build new transmission, and we have uh, on the state's path towards meeting its increasing renewable energy targets. Um, but transmission availability is a really important part of project siting. And the availability on the Central Coast right now is a strong factor supporting um, some commercial development there. Now that said, on the North Coast, um, the wind resource is, is very strong. It's, it's a very good wind resource. Um, and the DOD conflicts are less, and, and um, so as we look longer term at, you know, significantly larger potential amounts of offshore wind, we do have to look at the transmission question and, you know, starting with the actual feasibility of transmission out of the North Coast. It's not just a matter of, um, of estimating what a normal transmission line would cost because it's a uh, geographically very challenging terrain and, and such that as it is, there's actually very, very little transmission at all in and out of the Humboldt, or, you know, the Humboldt area, the Eureka Arcata area, for example, and broader um, Humboldt County. So um, the energy
Ecology Commission is uh, very interested in learning more about transmission. The OSHA Protection Council um, is supporting an analysis of transmission options from the North Coast that will help us better understand um, feasibility and opportunity and scale uh, for what would be possible in the North Coast. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, and this is Chris Potter from the OPC, if I might add. As much as I'd like to take credit for the the transmission part um, of the, the Humboldt equation, the governor's office of planning and research is, is funding even more. And we'll know um, later this year what, uh, what some of the costs and what some of the um, possible um, some C transmission scenarios look like. Thank you, Chris. I did mix that up. <laughs> okay. So, so thank you for those responses. I'm going to move on to the next question, and this actually is from Michael Jacobson. He was on his cell, but having cell problems, and so he submitted something in writing. And, and Michael Jacobson writes, and his comment pertains to Mayor Heading's comment uh, earlier on the engagement with community in Boehm uh, in the process of pre-bidding activities. And his question is, what is the task force's view on the process of potentially 14 companies engaging with the same stakeholders about the same activities, but all with potentially different propositions? And his fear is that we may confuse and wear out the goodwill of, of stakeholders unnecessarily. And he asks, uh, does the commission, and maybe he means the task force, have a view on how to prevent this and perhaps making uh, these now these new options to to firm requirements and, and, and prerequisites in bidding and moving this negotiation away from bidders to, to be determined by state the state and boom. Yeah hey Eric this is Doug I I think there's a lot in there. I can say that you know, and, and going back to, uh, you know, community benefits agreement, you know, we wouldn't make it a requirement to that every one of the 14 would have to go through that with the local stakeholders. Uh, you know, it's for those that choose to do that, and I know there are cases that have already done that, uh, you know, and so it would be something that the each individual company would decide if that was something that they wanted to pursue, you know, and it's something that, you know, we can potentially take into consideration as we move forward with the leasing process, but it wouldn't be a requirement for everyone to go through that same uh, that same process with the stakeholders to make sure that everyone had a community benefits agreement. So it would be up to the developers themselves if that answers the question. You know, I think anyone this is like Karen. This is Karen. I'll just say very briefly, this is not an area where the state has gotten directly involved. We are focusing on learning as much as we can about the leasing process that BOEM has and different experiences and outcomes in different states. And, and um, I think that in terms of finding ways to help uh, mitigate public confusion <laughs> or exhaustion if there is a lot of this activity in local areas. This could be a good opportunity for um, some of the local government representatives perhaps or, or other community you know, organizations to help provide um, you know, forums or, or help find ways to make the conversation that is occurring in, in some communities more um, organized. But this is not a place where the state has gotten involved directly at this point. Okay. Thank you very much, Karen, and, and thank you, Doug. I'm gonna, we have uh, two more uh, comments coming in via text, and then I see that uh, Tom Hafer has a hand up. And, We'll get to Tom third. Uh, so the, the first question or comment comes from Jason Bush of the Pacific Ocean Energy Trust. 
And he writes, uh, just a request of all those who are planning and funding the future of offshore wind on the West Coast, uh, especially our federal partners, uh, the imperative to develop uh, safe, clean energy from the oceans uh, is greater. Whoops. Um, sorry about that. Is greater than any single state's uh, RPS or clean energy goals. It's a global imperative and, of course, a regional one. So I encourage you to think broadly about offshore wind beyond specific projects or ports and consider how your research and studies, planning and investments could potentially further regional development of offshore wind, maximize the amount of energy that can be derived from this resource, and use our limited funding resources as effectively and efficiently as possible to move our society to a renewably electrified economy. More of a, a comment comes from Jason Bush. Thank you for that. Um, another question came from an anonymous user. Is, will there be any navigational restrictions regarding cables that must run from offshore to onshore coasts? Any navigational restrictions regarding cables that must run uh, from onshore to, offshore to the onshore coast? Come on. Oh, does someone want to weigh in? And do we have someone from the Coast Guard? They may be most appropriate to answer that. Yeah, this is Tyron Connor of District 11. So during our NAV, formal NAV risk assessment that the applicant would provide to us, we would be looking at the factor of um, not only on the platforms, but the cabling and and how does that impact um, navigation and everything. So our primary concern would be to maintain uh, current navigation routes, and, and we have some things that we're planning out on the future to try to help out with uh, future development. But um, that, that is one area that we will be looking at to make sure that there's minimal impact or even none, honestly. Great. Any other uh, responses to the question? Okay, um, let's go back up. Tom Hayford, do you still have a question? You can chime right in. Is Tom here? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, we can, but we have an echo. Tom, do you have your, is your computer audio on as well? Can you help me better now? Uh, yes. Do you want to there's a little background noise, but you want to give it a shot? Yeah, so this is uh, Tom Hafer. I'm, I'm losing this signal depending on where I am. So Tom, we had an echo coming in. Um, it, are you around your computer, which was that connected by audio as well? Is Tom still on? Is Tom still on? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm still here. Maybe, yeah, I'm still maybe we should type to type it in there. Yeah, so, so Tom, Tom, this is Eric. Is it possible for you to type in your question just because there's a, a large echo coming when you speak? Large echo coming when you speak. Well, I don't have so much of a question as a as a few comments. What's going on? Yeah, so if you well, just because of the echo, I think we're going to need to mute the line. Is it possible to to type in your comment, or or, or maybe try dialing in again, um, again separately um, without? So we want to avoid the echo. Avoid the echo. Hello. Okay, so I, I, yes. Well, so, so I'm going to invite Tom to to try to connect again. In the meantime, I see uh, Nancy Kirshner Rodriguez with the hand up. Nancy, are you on? Yeah. 
Yes, okay. thank you. Thank I you, Jeffrey. Not, um, I had not dialed in. I was listening online, so thank you. And um, I'm with the Business Network for Offshore Wind, which is a national nonprofit only focused on the development of offshore wind. And we've been working with uh, federal, state, and local partners um, on the East Coast as well. Now on the West Coast, it's been almost eight years. I, I want to thank everyone for your commitment and your work. And just I know there were hundreds of people on the phone, and I'm hoping some of them, I know some of them are our members and maybe a lot. Um, our members range across the supply chain, over 300 businesses, developers, manufacturers, installers, divers, welders, vessel companies, et cetera. I wanted to ask, since we are so involved in this process, is there anything that the state can say about how they see that this process will be integrated with the ongoing work for SD100, IRP, and the KISO transmission planning process. Um, and then my second question is, after a year of data is collected by the LIDARs, will that then, um, will that then enable to the, uh, the leasing to go ahead? So Nancy, this is Karen. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just speak to your first question. Um, obviously, this process informs and continues to inform the Energy Commission and, and the CPUC, and, which is here, and other state agencies about the progress and potential for offshore wind in California and also the time frame. And, and so our being informed helps to improve and inform all of the work that we do. And that being said, um, I encourage you where you where relevant to follow these other processes directly and um, not assume that comments submitted into our docket, for example, for the offshore wind process make it into the CPUC proceedings or the IPER docket or anything uh, like that automatically. Mm -hmm. Do anyone else want to respond to Nancy's question. Eric, this is Doug. I'll just touch on it real quick about the buoy deployment. So I wouldn't say it would enable leasing. I would say that, you know, we definitely plan on gathering that information. You know, the plan is that we will make it the data that comes from the LIDAR buoy available in near real time on a website uh, so that people can see what the data is looking like as it's being collected. You know, at the end of the day, at the collection of the data should hopefully inform decisions about leasing, but I wouldn't say that it would enable us to move forward. We just hope to add value to the leases when we move forward after we find appropriate areas. Okay. Nancy, does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So, so we have a, a, another comment. I actually think it's a response to a previous question that's coming from Walt Musial, who's, I, I believe, with uh, the Department of Energy. And he says, if I understand the question, the trade-off between 15 megawatt and 1.5 megawatt turbines is a huge cost-benefit with the larger turbine. However, there was an assumption, I think, that smaller turbines would have a lower visual impact, and this is subjective, but one would have to decide if 666 1.5 megawatt turbines would have a lower visual impact than 66 15 megawatt turbines. The larger turbines would be more visible on an individual basis, but historically stakeholders prefer having fewer larger turbines. So I think that's a Walt weighing in on a previous uh, question. And, and then finally, we have a, another comment coming in from Joel Merriman. He says, thank you for this webinar and providing the opportunity for public questions and feedback. We remain concerned about the potential impacts of these projects on seabirds. In our understanding, there is still not viable technology to monitor post-construction bird mortalities from turbine strikes in terms of which species are affected and in what quantities. Um, if that is correct, 
can, can you comment on how this uncertainty is taken into account in siting and other aspects of planning? And Joel is with the American Bird Conservancy. So let's, let's pause there and invite uh, other task force members to weigh in. And, and I'm still hoping to get back to Tom Hafer at some point, too. So task force members commenting on how uh, bird impacts are taken into consideration. Eric, this is Doug at Boom. I'll say that I cannot answer Joel's questions intelligently, but I believe that you know David Perexta, who is the Boom Pacific Region avian expert. And I don't know if Dave is on the line, but he will be able to give a complete rundown of the studies that we have ongoing. You know, it is something that we are, you know, we know it's an issue and we've are excellent studies program that we have uh, is one of the issues that we're addressing to include, you know, how can we monitor after something goes in to make sure, you know, it's like it's not on shore where you can do an avian count at the base of the wind turbines. So it is a technology that's being developed. There is, uh, there's definitely an effort on the federal government side to come up with technologies for that. Uh, but like I said, Dave is, Perexta in our office is the expert in this and can shed more light, but I'm not sure if he's on the line. All right, this is Karen. I was pausing for a minute to see if Dave is on the line. Um, so the Energy Commission recently hosted a workshop um, to help uh, inform data collection efforts around offshore wind and, and that information um, working with BOEM is going into the California Offshore Wind Energy Gateway. And um, we hope to use that gateway that in order to um, facilitate the exchange and dialogue on scientific information and data around um, species, species prevalence, uh, different potential conflicts and constraints and so on. And, and so um, I think, though, I, I'd like to ask some of the Energy Commission staff in the room to speak to this from both the uh, perspective of MISA, if there's anything else on the gateway, or and also the research division. You could go ahead. Yeah, this is Sylvia. OK, this is Sylvia for the research division, California Energy Commission. Uh, as I mentioned before in my presentation, next wind so, so solicitation have one of the groups that were focused on environmental risk as assessment for offshore wind energy projects or system. So we are giving funds to two proposals, and one of them is with the Humboldt State University and HT Harvey and Associate, and they will create a 3D spatial distribution of seabirds density, species composition, and flight height for California coast. So this is one of the efforts that Next Wind uh, tried to uh, help us to understand uh, the wildlife impacts of offshore wind projects. And the other projects, just to mention, uh, with the integral consulting, uh, will study, um, will conduct a study to determine the potential changes in coast upwelling is no wildlife, but well. And, uh, yeah, so those two projects are focused more in the environmental issues of offshore. This is Nisa Werner from the Energy Commission. I'm glad that you brought up the gateway. I think at this point we have over 600 data sets assembled there now. And one of the research projects that we've been coordinating with um, in partnership with OPC is to coordinate on a couple of studies that are complementary and looking at uh, existing marine and coastal data sets to uh, identify data gaps even with all of those data sets. So that's, that works underway, um, primarily Point Blue and Conservation Biology Institute are working on that. And we hope to, um, I think as Chris, Chris Potter mentioned earlier, we hope to have some interim products to share with folks to, um, before those studies are completed. Uh, but yeah, if you if you go to um, the offshore wind gateway, which is accessible via that website that I showed during my 
presentation, you can take a spin around and see the data sets that we have organized into topical galleries, um, including you know, bird data sets and, and other things. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Thank you. And, and this is Chris Potter. I, I would just add to what Misa said that Point Reyes has a special um, history and long history with bird conservation and uh, research. So I'm expecting a particularly good product from them relative to birds. Um, so thank you for the multiple comments back on the, the question about avian impacts. Um, we're trying to uh, finish up, uh, see anyone else listed right now, and uh, Eric, I'm wondering, oh yeah. Uh, oh. Eric, this is Jeremiah. Hello? Yes, yes, go ahead, Jeremiah. Uh, sorry, Eric, I probably wasn't logged in there. Uh, I'm just on my flip phone here. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, Eric, I had a comment, and uh, if it's uh, to make, if it's possible, just uh, yeah, and a question. Yeah, that's fine. Well, thank you. Introduce thank yourself, you. please. Oh, uh, my name is Jeremiah O'Brien. I'm Vice President of the Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen's Organization here in Morro Bay. And... Uh, yeah, I, I had a question, uh, and I was just wondering, with the new charts and everything, we, we had spent many years, of course, uh, as you're aware, that of working with uh, various wind companies, uh, Trident and Mount Castle, of course. But in any case, uh, there was a lot of that area. It wasn't just chosen. The original Morro Bay call area was not just chosen haphazardly. It was a, an area where there was a great deal of wind. Uh, and given that and, and the uh, choices for the fishing industry to be the least amount of impact that we could find uh, from that area, the new areas uh, somewhat changed that. And I, I was just wondering, I guess, making a long question of this, I was just wondering how much weight the original Morro Bay Carl area still had on this project. And uh, again, reiterating on things like uh, this, the new charts indicate uh, a change in the view shed, uh, a change in the fishing areas, a change in the areas uh, of uh, the mo more intense wind. So uh, given all of these other problems, do you see a possibility for the original Morro Bay Call area to come online that would accommodate two contiguous um, um, projects? But I hope that was clear. Yeah, th thank you, Jeremiah. So a question for task force members about how much weight do the, the original Morro Bay call areas have given this more recent focus on additional areas? Yeah, I'll take a first stab at that. <clears throat> and thanks, Jeremiah. I, I think that, you know, the process that we've entered into now is looking at the additional areas that are closer in from the 20 of the Morro Bay call area. So the Morro Bay call area is not off the table. It's still, these are just additional areas that we wanted to solicit public input. Because uh, as you said, Jeremiah, you know, it's something that, you know, we haven't heard. So, you know, we want to hear so that we can make decisions uh, that are appropriate in the future. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to say where things are going to land uh, because there is a lot of, you know, our partners at Department of Defense, uh, you know, so this is something that, you know, there's a lot of, aspects that have to be taken into consideration moving forward with, you know, determining areas that are appropriate for leasing. Uh, but I think we're in the beginning of the process now. The Morro Bay call area is still on the table, uh, and we're just looking at additional areas, you know, in the north A or in the north and the south areas that are on the map that are out for public comment now. Right, I see. Well, that, that's good. Yeah, I didn't I just wanted to make sure it was still on the table, uh, and given the 
the uh, problems that would be inherent with some of the newer areas, uh, view shed and so forth, and the fishing areas, it would be, I'm glad it's still on the table. Thank you very much for taking the call. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Yeah. Th this is Karen. I, I just also wanted to add that Doug's answer is exactly correct. And what would be, you know, you referenced potential problems with the new areas, whatever input you have about the new potential areas, um, you know, we'd like to hear it and we'd like to have that input as we look at what might be possible going forward. Yes, okay, well, thank you, Karen. Yeah, it, it pretty much changes a lot of the work that was done in the past, at least uh, requires another uh, response. So thank you very much. Okay, great. So I have, a, this is Eric from Crimson West. I have a, one more comment that I'm going to read. We, we've been trying to track down Tom Hafer. Uh, we, we believe he's uh, perhaps on his uh, fishing vessel and, and uh, having trouble connecting, and we left a, a message for him. But uh, if uh, if Tom comes back on, please jump in, um, and we'll do our best to to get it before we finish up. But we, we have about ten minutes to go in the call. So so this next uh, comment comes from Sandy Ellsworth with the Natural Resources Defense Council, and she writes, uh, "Apologies, I missed the answer to this question before." But I'm curious to know what exactly is implied by the quote discussion area within the within the Monterey Bay Nas Nas National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, NRDC is concerned by the implications that an established National Marine Sanctuary uh, would be considered for offshore wind development. NRDC is a strong supporter of offshore wind development in waters offshore California and believes that its development must not also compromise established areas of high biodiversity. The IPCC has noted that we must urgently transition to clean energy and stem biodiversity loss if we are to protect human life. Uh, a, a comment, Sandy, uh, sorry, Eric, I'll, I'll just jump in. This is Karen. Sandy, um, we appreciate that comment. And, and um, if you'd like to make that comment into the docket, we you know generally encourage um, comments and responses both on the areas that, uh, you know, the north and south area and on people's thoughts about the discussion area to the extent that you have them and you clearly do. Okay, good. Um, are there any other uh, members of the public who would like to uh, take a final opportunity to ask a question or to share a comment? If so, please raise your hand now. Jeremiah said it already. Oh, it, oh. Who is that trying to speak? So you have me now? This is Tom Ifer again. Yeah, Tom. Well, welcome back. Yes, you, you have the floor, Tom. It sounds a lot better. Um, yeah, I just appreciate there and Jeremiah's comments, and I'm also I'm the president of the Morro Bay Fishing Organization, and John Heading's comments on the fisheries and how long we've been dealing with castle wind for the last four years now, I think it is. Um, that call area, the original call area of Morro Bay, worked for us since we're the most directly affected by this, the fishermen. Um, so these other areas that are cut up, um, the south and the north and the discussion area, it, it's not viable for a wind farm to be in a small area like that. They need a, at least 120 square miles to make it viable for them to even to, to work, to get power, you know, tomorrow day. So um, the fishermen like the original call area. I wish the DOD would, would give a little on that. Um, and you know the the one comment from that one guy about the different wind farms coming into California, and and putting in putting in these wind farms, they should have to talk to the fishermen first, because we're the ones that are directly affected by this. We're going to lose more area, fishing area, and the way it looks here, 
it's a huge area. So it should be a law, a rule, I don't know what you want to call it, but since this is all new to California, there needs to be some new regulations put in saying that any wind farm that comes into California has to negotiate with fishermen. It's got to be that way. I know BOEM doesn't see it like that, but we see it that way, and we're the ones that are directly affected. So that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, final opportunity for responses from task force members. Hey, this is Doug at Boom. I just wanted to take an opportunity and just say, hey, Tom, I hear you. I would say, you know, and, and really the process, the process is what it is. And right now, you know, Boom and the state are leading the effort to, you know, make sure that we coordinate with the fishermen appropriately. Uh, you know, hopefully we've done a good job thus far uh, and that we're not done yet. Uh, we're coming out with new rounds to talk about the new areas and your comments are appreciated. Uh, you know, although we agree that it would be beneficial for developers to talk to the fishermen now, the reality is you can. Oh, I don't know. Go ahead, Doug. Oh, sorry. I thought that may have been a follow-up question. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the reality is I fully expect that, you know, once there is a lessee in the areas, you know, that the coordination will happen then. You know, it's, you know, like uh, like we said earlier, there's, you know, 14 companies that are interested. You know, not all of those are going to participate in the lease sale. Uh, so it may be that you are talking to the fishermen who plan on participating in the future. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I hope that, you know, we'll make sure that we reach out to, especially the fishermen in the area of the city of Morro Bay. Uh, you know, I did want to say that, you know, the mayor, I have said that our public meeting that we plan on having, we're coming to the city. Uh, we we like it there, and I don't mind at all coming to, coming to Morro Bay for a meeting. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll continue the conversation. You know, the states and feds, we really think it's very important, uh, and we want to make sure that we're, we know that the fishermen are going to be uh, potentially impacted by any project offshore California. All right. Uh, thank you, Tom, for your, your comment and uh, and uh, for that response, Doug, I think we, we're nearing the top of the hour. I see one more hand up. So we will take this, this final comment and then we'll wrap. This is coming from Mike Conroy. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, hi, thanks again. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on what Tom said and I, I fully agree with what he said. You know, it, it, I would also recommend you bring fishermen and fishing interests into the conversation during the sighting conversations. Because as we've seen with this BOEM one, uh, the, the, the call area in Central California, a lot of the users that fish at, and there's data that shows that that's a really important area to the albacore fleets. And I know that none of the albacore fleets, none of the groups representing the albacore fleets were contacted by BOEM. We had to find out about it secondhand. We, we begged BOEM to come and address, you know, address us with us, falls on deaf ears. So I think even before you get to the point where there's a leasing conversation, you know, when it comes time to siting uh, conversations, the, the fishermen, groups representing fishermen are, are more than happy to work with you to help determine which siting areas will have the least amount of impact on commercial fisheries, recreational fisheries, our ability to provide seafood to the state and to the nation and provide that benefit as well. Thanks. Okay, Mike, I appreciate that follow-up comment. Um, so I, I guess I'm going to look through the phone uh, to, to Jean and Doug and Karen one last time. Uh, any final comments or from other task force members before we wrap up today? Uh, this is Jean. I'll start, and then um, maybe Karen and Doug can add. I just want to say if you have any, any questions or you would like uh, you have some other concerns that have come up, during this webinar, please feel free to contact me directly, um, and I will answer any questions uh, or 
send you to the people that we have on our staff that can provide those answers. And thank you very much for attending, and um, I'll hand it over to um, Karen and Doug if there's any final comments. Well, and this, is, this is Doug. Just wanted to add thanks to everyone for participating, and thanks to the public for staying on the line and providing us with some good thoughts and input into this. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I did want to say that, you know, again, thanks to Jean, and just to let everyone know that she truly is the glue that keeps this together. So any questions that you have, please feel free to reach out to her. Uh, and she will make sure that things happen. All right. And um, this is Karen. I, again, want to thank the task force members, um, members of the public who uh, listened in and then joined in the dialogue. Um, and uh, we, we have a docket. We encourage everybody who has comments to submit to the docket. We're also very happy to, um, you know, hear your suggestions for, for outreach and, and who needs to be talked to. We appreciate the suggestions that were made today. Um, I also want to thank Jean and I want to thank uh, the Energy Commission um, staff who helped us pull this webinar together. And um, with that, I think we'll hand this back to Eric. Okay, great. So just to close, I want to thank everybody for helping to accommodate uh, having a big webinar. We had over 300 participants, and, and uh, I think it's important to be able to uh, expand as needed in remote meetings like this um, uh, when, when needed. Um, and just to let everybody know that when you log off the webinar, you will be given the opportunity to complete a post-meeting evaluation survey. This will provide you with opportunities for, for sharing what worked and what didn't, and we want to continue to refine these in the future. So, so thank you to everybody for your, your contributions and for helping uh, make this, this